a video response to the user known as Feminist Frequency. She is a hardcore feminist. Take note of the word hardcore feminist. And I've been requested to make a video response to her videos for over the past year, in fact. Um, uh, I have a lot of people send me her videos wanting me to respond to her, but I've resisted in doing so simply because I think a lot of the positions she holds are crazy, and I just didn't really want to get... Well, Mr. Repzion, um, I'm just going to introduce myself. I am Manslave. I, uh, I run the Validation Warfare YouTube channel. Um... And I was just, as you can hear, I was just listening to um, some of your video. It's called uh, "Re," you know, uh, response to damsel in distress. You know, uh, you know what video you did? Um, the one to uh, Anita Sarkeesian of uh, Feminist Frequency. <clears throat> well, you just mentioned that she uh, holds crazy ideas. Um, well, you know, that's uh, it's not even the half of it. Um, yeah, uh, you think her ideas are crazy, and you're probably probably right. However, do you know why she's uh, do you know why she's the crazy like that? Um, the, the, you know uh, the uh, as they say, the devil is in the details. Well, it is. Um, I've watched these videos you've talked about. I finished watching the second of the damsels in distress. Um, series last night um finally she's showing off some of that money that uh you know uh, anita sarkeesian is showing off some of that money that she had um collected last year in 2012 and uh the one th uh, the the 158,922 dollars which is around 26 times what she had originally uh requested to raise um and of course how she did it well, if you or I got on there, or several other people, you know, we might not have such fundraising skills, you know. Maybe we don't have a cause that a lot of people are interested in. Uh, Anita Sarkeesian has hit on the, poten the, the potential cash cow for the next, at least for the next decade, possibly for the next century. Um... It's a cash cow that has been several millennia in the making. And feminists have capitalized on this in a very unique time in history. People need to look at the context in which feminism arose. Just as a person can know what other people are talking about uh, based upon context or what people are describing. You know, um, context is very, very important for understanding the meanings of things. For example, you or anybody else have probably heard words used in a sentence that you have never heard of. However, based on the context in which those words are used, you are able to somewhat get a general kind of uh, overall understanding of what the word means based on the context in which it was used. That is the key to understanding feminism. And, you know, people think that feminism only arose in the 1960s because that's when it, it really came to the surface and gave itself a name. Uh, that's not the origins of feminism. Uh, the fem you know, uh, the origins of girl power go back to at least uh, the 1920s uh, with, you know, women, uh, you know, and voting rights. Actually, they go back further than that. Uh, look at the First World War and the White Feather campaigns to uh, to basically shame men uh, out of pacifism, to actually encourage men to go fight and die horrible deaths on the battlefield. And it wasn't just machine gun fire or, bar or barbed wire. Uh, there was artillery. There was chemical warfare with chlorine and mustard gas, which is very horrible. Uh, flamethrowers were introduced during World War I. Uh, although rifled artillery had been around before um, uh, the First World War, it was actually the first major war platform in which artillery, uh, rifled artillery was, was just typically used uh, for its accuracy and all that. A high explosive was used um, in the artillery. Uh, artillery uh, shells were used 
as a type of vehicle for for delivering um um you know death of course obviously uh but instead of just you know a solid um a solid steel projectile that would leave a crater in the ground uh just because of its sheer mass and its force um well you know during uh the first world war you know they they would fill some of these artillery shells with um with um with uh, <clears throat> high explosive uh, they would fill it with types of chemicals to deliver gas attacks. Um, yeah, I mentioned uh, flamethrowers were introduced. Uh, there was aerial bombardment from airplanes. Uh, the the fighter aircraft and the bomber aircraft were both introduced. Um, there were just uh, all, all kinds of other horrible weapons of war. Um, you know, the tank was introduced and that sort of thing. Um... And so was armor-piercing um, ammunition. Just a variety of things. It was a very horrible war. Um, millions upon millions of, of men, men, died in World War I. Um, in a particular battle, there was 58,000 men who died on a particular day uh, during one of the battles. Um, I forget which one it was. I don't know if it was in 1915 or was it 1916, but anyway, it was one of the the, the big battles there. Uh, 58,000. That's a significant number because that's the overall amount of men who died during the entire Vietnam conflict, which lasted several years. Um, you know, we all hear about how horrible Vietnam is, and I'm not disputing that. However. You know, during that whole war where we were involved for roughly about a decade or whatever, <clears throat> uh, you know, over that course of those several years, uh, it was about 58,000 men who died um, during the Vietnam <clears throat> during the Vietnam War. However, during during World War One, there were there was a there was a particular battle in which 58,000 men died in just one day. Um, I mean, the, 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 the casualties, the, the death tolls for World War I average, like, somewhere around, anywhere from six to 10,000 men dying, you know, just on a, you know, like, on a particular side, uh, you know, per day. Uh, very horrible. And what were the women doing during, during World War I? Well, they were back home in safety and basically complaining about voter rights. Yep, which actually in the context for women was actually more resembling that of a voter privilege because, you know, it, you know, if you know anything about the history of uh of franchise uh political franchise in America, um you know, men got the right to vote, you know, universally in the late 1800s uh because, you know, it was almost like a you know, a just reward, um, you know, uh, uh, out of fairness because of how many men died during the Civil War. <clears throat> a lot of men died during the Civil War without political franchise. Um, the same thing for World War One. That was only a century ago, about 98 years ago, uh, as this is 2013 right now. And... <clears throat> Still, there were men who fought in World War I who did not have voting rights <clears throat> for two reasons. Uh, depending on what country they belonged to, um, the, you know, uh, the, the prop, you know, owning property, you know, class status, and just that sort of thing, which was definitely a factor during the 1800s um, as a criteria for, for voting. Uh, you had to be of a certain class in society to have any political franchise. Uh, so, yes, men had the right to vote, but very few men had the right to vote. Let's see what else. Um, yeah, well, there were also, uh, people fighting on the battlefield who were not 18 years old. The minimum fighting age was 17, uh, legally. Now, I was in the United States Army, um, I went in in the year 2000, and in my unit, uh, in, in my specific platoon... 
there was a person of the age of 17 uh, who was in there, uh, you know, for, for basic training. And they got in there at the age of 17, and we were all wondering how, because we all thought you had to be 18 to join. But the drill sergeant told us that there is a exemption uh, for people of age 17 if their parents sign a waiver. You know, it's extra hoops to jump through, but yet it's possible. Um... So this was in the year 2000, and that was only 13 years ago, you know. I don't know if that 17-year age has changed. Uh, I don't know. I haven't been in for a while, <clears throat> and I haven't looked up the, the info on that. But I witnessed a 17-year-old in my platoon in the United States Army uh, back in the year 2000. And <clears throat> anyway... The, um, so, well, this had also happened about 98, you know, uh, years ago, 97 years ago, uh, back in the year of, um, you know, back in, well, actually, years, uh, but during the time period of the First World War, there were many men, uh, 17 years old, fighting on the battlefield. They were not 18, they did not have voting rights, um, and yet they were dying on the battlefield every day, um, uh, without political franchise, without the right to vote. Now, what were these 20 and 30 year old women doing uh, back in America? Well, they were, you know, uh, some of them were in very uh, comfortable uh, situations. Not all of them, I'm sure not all of them. I mean, some of them still did live on farms, but not the ones who had any time to really protest. Um, notice that. That's a little another, that's another little piece of context to understanding the origins of where feminism came from. Uh, the mystery, if it dare be solved. So anyway, <clears throat> um, so women were back home in safety because they were not fighting on the battlefield. Uh, they were back home in safety and they were complaining about voting rights. They said that it was unfair that men had the right to vote and women didn't. Well, the thing is, look at the context in which men received the right to vote universally because of their sacrifices for the, con for the country. And, you know, the way I interpret, you know, the government's actions at that time, it's like, well, these people, they got all chewed up on the battlefield and all tore up. The least we can do is give them voting rights. Meh. You know, that's how I interpreted uh, the, the, the outcome of uh, the, the whole franchise kind of situation, political franchise. Uh, men had to earn it. And... Women didn't. Women just demanded it. Uh, women demanded it because they wanted it. It is another key psychological aspect of the female mind in which they invade almost, almost every aspect of male space and influence. And they demand a place at the table. Metaphorically, there's a reason why. Um, they, uh, you know, it just... Well, there's all kinds of insecurities, and this just gets into female nature and then human nature overall. Uh, I mean, it is a human nature thing. However, it's manifest more uniquely in the female <clears throat> um, through her treatment of, well, through the hypoagency in which she essentially enjoys, and that is toward the root of the problem for why Anita Sarkeesian behaves the way she does, makes videos about what she makes, or you know, the, the points that she makes, and all that. It's a very driving and motivating factor. Um, you know, I don't hate Anita Sarkeesian, and I think her videos are very well made, and they are entertaining. And I was watching her, you know, second video in the series of, uh, you know, um, well, Tropes versus Women, you know, Damsel in Distress, and all that. <clears throat> And it's very well made, and I was looking at it, it's like, wow, this is good enough to be on TV. I mean, for the most part, you know, I mean, it's, I think it's, you know, like television quality. And, yeah, it's well made, and it's entertaining, and it's just, you know, it's, it's a, you know, it's pretty nice. Now, the content of her message on several occasions upset me, um, and really disturbed me, because, I mean, you know, sh she does have the right to complain about whatever she, you know, doesn't like or whatever, as we all should. But she has made in the past and still continues to make some pretty slanderous, very slanderous things about the male gender. Um, now, she did, 
she did include just a tiny dash and pinch of uh, of uh, balance in her video. Um, uh, you know, the part where she says, you know, the boys club, I guess, as she alludes to a lot of times in gaming, you know, you know, it's not like they're all nefarious people that, you know, twist around their mustache and think of ways to harm women. I mean, that part I, I agreed with, you know, and I'm like, okay, I think I, I think as I was laying on the couch watching this, this, uh, this video last night, I think I did, you know, give a thumbs up for that little instance of, um, of uh of her speech or you know anyway but you know where she would just went on beating the adamantium horse of female vic of exclusive female victimhood you know the monopoly of female victimhood you know where she finally got around to talking about real issues that affect women like violence and just whatever in other countries and all that um I think she did that under pressure because for a while she has not talked about it. I mean, I've got, I think I got all of her videos from the Feminist Frequency uh, channel uh, archived on, uh, I think I got them in triplicate. I, I think I got them on three different external USB hard drives um, <clears throat> because I archive stuff like that. <clears throat> You know, uh, Mr. Repzion, if your channel generates enough interest for me, maybe I'll archive all your videos, you know. But um, I uh, archived all of Barbarossa, Stardust, Man, Woman, Myth, Girl Rates What. I think I got all of Rocking Mr. E. Uh, I, got of all, I got all of that cynical cynicism. Um, a few others I got all of them. I think the Ignored Gender. Uh, I think I got all of Shadow MGTOW. Um, uh, anyway... <clears throat> so, um, you know, as I was watching her videos, you know, this is the first time that I noticed that she actually made mention of, like, real suffering, you know, and not just the first world, you know, preference problems or whatever uh, of offending female sensibilities. <clears throat> Excuse me, I just woke up not long ago, so I still got to clear my throat. So, anyway, um... So I was I was laying on the couch watching this, um, her, her latest video, uh, you know, uh, Damsel in Distress Part Two, and where she basically beats the adamantium horse of uh, of unique monopolistic female victimhood, and I just I remember holding both hands up toward the television with double middle fingers, you know, if effectively, you know, uh, just middle finger each hand, you know. Uh, as I was watching that part, because it's more scaremongering and fearmongering, and it's very unbalanced, and it, it's it's very unique to the, the, the female mind, and the way women see themselves collectively. Uh, this is why, you know, socialism, Marxism, and communism were so popular with women in the 1960s and 70s, <clears throat> And, you know, I do not think that communism created uh, feminism and all that. Um, I believe that women jumped upon Marxism as some kind of bandwagon because they thought that it would provide them something of interest. Um, you know, I don't think that there was necessarily any kind of conspiracy in which, you know some kind of communistic movement. I don't think, you know, that they, you know, kind of really conspired to, to, um, you know, create feminism. Um, feminism did happen, yes, but it was, um, I think it's more of a hijacking of our time. We do have a unique time in history, and this goes back into the context of where feminism arose, because as Stardust and I think Barbarossa had mentioned in the past that, that uh, feminism is weaponized female nature. Uh, you look at the origins of uh, girl power-ism, uh, like I mentioned, dating back to the First World War. It goes back even further than that with uh, <clears throat> the late 1800s and uh, Susan B. Anthony and voting. Um... I don't know if it goes back further than that, but what you notice during that time, the late 1800s uh, through the early 1900s, is um, 
when when the standard of living had a, 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 a significant increase because of the 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 uh, the results of um, mechanization, mass production, uh, which made the nation more profitable. <clears throat> And that sort of thing, and this profitability had eventually trickled into society and had raised the standard of living. Not for everybody, I agree. I mean, you know, the, we hear about these horrible stories of, like, immigrants packed into houses that were, like, on the verge of crumbling apart, you know, physically, and buildings that should have been condemned. Um, yeah, there were, you know, immigrants, you know, in, in, in parts of New York that were cramped into these horrible spaces... Um, you know, and yeah, I'm not disputing that. However, you know, <clears throat> the standard of living for the average person today um, is is much higher than it was, uh, you know, a few centuries ago. And it was at this time when the standard of living made a significant increase, and that's when women basically it, it's like it caught their attention. Um, you know, like Susan B. Anthony, you know, back in the late 1800s, you know, I don't know if she called herself a feminism. She just, as far as the historical account, you know, was made that, you know, she was just a woman that thought that, you know, that it was unfair that women didn't have the right to vote. And then she just basically took it upon herself. She just went out and voted and then, you know, demanded that she be, you know, held accountable to the law and all that kind of stuff. And, <clears throat> the law that was at that time a little more fair toward men uh, because of men's, um, you know, sacrifice uh, to earn political franchise. And, um, of course, a woman by the name of Susan B. Anthony decided to violate that. Yeah, I'm, I'm acknowledging that women didn't have the right to vote back then, but, like, why, why did they need it, you know? I mean, they... Did they, like, risk life and limb in a war for it? Uh, what about World War One? And, and see, it's, and, and, you know, in case somebody's going to argue, I'm just already going to preface, uh, preface and go there. Because, you know, 30-some-odd uh, years ago, back in the late 70s through the early 80s, you know, Phyllis Schlafly um, a, uh, organized a bunch of women to defeat the uh, Equal Rights Amendment, also known as ERA, um, and keep it from being ratified and become... Yeah, yeah, get this. Women have actually defeated the Equal Rights Amendment to the United States Constitution that would give women absolute equality with men under the law. And it was women who defeated it. Uh, and I saw, you know, where Barbarossa uploaded that video, and he, um, he, he included video from that debate where Phyllis Schlafly was there with some kind of feminist woman, I forget what her name was, and they were talking about the Equal Rights Amendment and and uh, that sort of thing. And then, you know, <clears throat> Phyllis Schlafly said, you know, to, to the debate moderator, or moderator uh, said that, um, you know, Phyllis Schlafly said that, you know, the Equal Rights Amendment will not give women anything that they don't already have or have a way of getting. But furthermore, it will take away some of the rights and privileges and exemptions that women already enjoy. Now that right there is a very key, significant thing. Uh, women have always had privilege uh, throughout history, uh, especially uh, in the more modern era because men are so willing to do things for them. Um, you know, uh, of course this gets into the whole cultural thing of uh, validation, you know, uh, that, that if a man wants to feel fulfilled in life and like he has a, a need to exist, then he's supposed to take good care of a woman and make her happy and, and, you know, the whole fairy tale garbage stuff. Um, and he, he is basically told that he has to earn his happiness and it's all hinged upon the the very fickle, uh, volatile, uh, volatile meaning you know, unstable you know, fly away you know, not constantly there, or the the potential to j just disappear. Uh, but the the, the volatile uh, whims, the 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 um, the the uh, 
the the ever changing uh, unstable emotion um, and, and and fickleness of a woman uh, and her perception of him as a provi of a provider of utility usually protection provision that sort of thing and so in thus she becomes almost like a goddess and you know <clears throat> and whether or not she gives him any benefits or blessings you know as the goddess let's let's you know portray her symbolize her let's say as a uh, uh as like a goddess or whatever you know like the, the whole kind of religion kind of thing you know it's like whether or not she uh you know whether or not she uh dispenses wrath or or you know uh favor or blessings or benefit or whatever well she is entirely uh driven by emotion which is ever changing just like the winds um and that sort of thing so it's a not, it's not a very stable foundation in which to um to base someone's self worth you know upon something so you know uh so temporary so unstable as a person's perception through the lens of emotion uh so anyway <clears throat> but that's what happens. That's a society that we live in. Um, so anyway, uh, women have always been able to get what they want. Um, and that's the thing. Um, okay, I'm going to... You know, I've rambled on for how long? Oh, gosh, it's like 25 minutes or so. Um, that, that And, you know, I'm just going to... Well, I preface that. Oh gosh, it's going to be a long video. Okay, Mr. Represent, uh, Repzion, I'm going to just play a little more of your video and let you hear this. Give her any of my attention or time. However, she recently started a, a video series called Damsels in Distress, where she's examining females in video games. And to summarize her 26-minute long video, she examines games from the eight, uh, 1980s and 1990s and a little bit of more recent games, and she examines the male protagonist and the females in the video games, trying to argue somehow that women are an object, sexualized objects in video games. And to an extent, I can understand where she's coming from, and it's true, in some video games, women are sexualized objects. I understand that, and I'm not disagreeing with that. However, her main argument is that women are made out to be an object and a damsel in distress where a woman is not the main protagonist of the game and how and that's exactly the problem for women <clears throat> i'm gonna have to explain female nature to you um uh, you know mr repzion i'm not saying that you're stupid or anything like that it's just you know i, I don't personally know you i've never communicated w with you before at the time of making this recording which is, of course, you know, Friday, May 31st of 2013, uh, <clears throat> at uh, 12.37 Eastern Time. Um, just saying, you know, later I might contact you and let you know that I made a video response, something like that. Anyway, I'm not calling you stupid or making any assumptions of such, you know, I'm just, I'm just stating that I don't personally know you, therefore I feel like I need to... Explain and preface a bit so that, you know, I can make sure that we have some kind of mutual understanding of the, the problem here, as you mentioned in your video. Um, once again, your video is, you know, re, you know, damsels in distress, you know, like a response <clears throat> uh, to Anita Sarkeesian of, uh, I've only watched a, maybe a couple minutes of it so far, but, you know, it, it, it's not bad, you know, um, your videos look like they're well made, also. But anyway, uh, they look like they're better, like they're better made than mine. But you know, that doesn't even bother me. It doesn't even bother me that, that some of you people on YouTube make excellent videos and that mine look pretty crappy. I mean, yeah. I mean, I wish I could, you know, like, like, you know, I wish that my videos would look great like yours. But like, that's not like a priority to me. Uh, I got other things. I got. Stuff. So many other computer technology and whatever hobbies and stuff to deal with, and uh, 
so anyway, I mean, you know, there's there's no, like, jealousy or anything like that. Unlike how Anita Sarkeesian and other women are, and especially feminists, very, very jealous of the male gender. Um, okay, now, what I'm going to get into with female nature is, okay, there is human nature, which is universal amongst all humans. <clears throat> You know, of course, this gets into Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, shelter, food, water, you know, comfortable temperatures, so on and so forth. You know, that's an example of the universal. Uh, you know, there is a universal need for comfort, you know, for approval, for this and that, you know. I'm sure you can find out what the universal attributes of human nature are. You know, there's there's jealousy, there's hate, there's deceit, there's love, there's happiness, there's there's joy, there's laughter, there's curiosity, you know, there's all these sorts of things. <clears throat> and they are universal to the human species. However, there are also unique subsets of human nature um, based upon... Um, other characteristics and um, other things that that develop, um, you know, uniquely within a you know a group of of humans or whatever. I mean, for example, look at other countries; they have different languages and different cultures. You know, they, you know, all humans, you know, communicate with each other. <clears throat> Now, Mr. Rebzion, you and I both use the English language, more specifically the American version of the English language, um, you know, which is a form of communication. Now, there are other people in other countries who speak different languages. What the common, you know, the, the, what they have in common is that they are forms of communication, you know, verbal and written forms of communication. That's what they have in common. That's universal. However, you know, the, the, the syllables, the diphthongs, the pronunciation system, the grouping of letters to, per, to create that pronunciation system, um, and then the meaning uh, assigned to, you know, a word or, you know, um, or a definition or whatever is a little bit different. Um, you know, uh, for example, um, the, um, the, you know... Uh, what we understand as curiosity, um, <clears throat> being intrigued by something, you know, really wanting to know what something is. In the English language, we use the word curiosity. Now, in the French language, it, it would be a different word, meaning the same thing. Uh, the Japanese language, of course, it would be a different word, meaning the same thing, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, so you see, you know, the, the human thought is universal, which is, you know, curious about something, for this example. However, the, the, um, the, the means of, you know, but however what's unique to other countries and other cultures is the word that they use for that thought or that phenomenon or whatever. And that's the kind of differential that I'm talking about here with the differences, uh, in, uh, in the the manifestation of human nature, uh, I'm talking about the differences between male nature and female nature. Um, <clears throat> because of uh, of biology, and re and specifically reproductive biology, it has caused men and women to develop on uh, uniquely different. Um, uh, you know, to t basically uniquely, uh, very unique and different paths in in uh, in our evolution, our our development. You know, whether or not you believe in creation or evolution, you know, uh, that 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 doesn't matter right now because um, men and women have taken uniquely different developmental paths throughout human history, and um. You know, this has this has led men to, in some ways, through you know, like what Darwin talks about, you know, uh, natural selection talks about, um, uh, you know, uh, adapting to the environment and that sort of thing. It is, well, it's sad to say this, but the male, the male gender has developed throughout history to 
to basically become superior to the female. And I know it's sad to say this, and hey, trust me, <laughs> two years ago I would not have been saying this, you know. <clears throat> Probably not even a year ago, uh, maybe, but, you know. Um, I mean, that's just a fact. I mean, look at it, you know. People notice that there's a physical strength difference between men and women, but they don't seem to understand how that happened. Um, you know, there, there is the microcosm and the macrocosm, um, you know, to take into consideration. Let's say on the macrocosm um, level <clears throat> that, you know, there's a female bodybuilder. And she spends most of her time lifting weights, eating healthy, getting plenty of exercise and all that. Yes, she will become stronger than the average male, especially stronger than somebody like you or I. <clears throat> Excuse me. However, um, you know, you'll notice that uh, sometimes these female bodybuilders will have a certain type of hubris, a certain type of attitude. You know, they say, they, they basically boast of their own physical superiority to many of the men around them. <clears throat> And they, you know, throw around all that girl power, you know, chatter and stuff. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, um, you know, they say, look, I'm stronger than man. And, you know, that's the, this, you know, not all female bodybuilders do this, but I'm just saying, you know, a situation in which, you know, a woman has finally achieved physical strength, at least on par or superior to some of the men around her. And then what she'll do is almost take a bully mentality of where she will, she will say, Look, I'm stronger than these men. Meh. And then, you know, it's basically a superiority complex, uh, superiority complex, which is oftentimes in, in people, human nature, to, to you know, the, the, the superiority complex is perhaps a compensator, an, an attempt to balance against a inferiority complex. Uh, oftentimes, <clears throat> and uh, the the fact remains that although yes, she you know this female bodybuilder is uh, physically stronger and has superior physical capabilities um, compared to many men around her. However, the fact remains that there will always be a male bodybuilder that is stronger than her, and you know so she knows that she can never. Uh, she knows, well, she learns from that situation that she can never, um, topple, you know, the, 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 the physical strength potential of a male, uh, of a man. <clears throat> uh, so there, you know, um, under these circumstances, uh, you know, there, there is a, uh, there is a inequality, um, you know, uh, be between the men and the woman, uh, between men and women, in that regard, yes, a female, you know, a particular female can become superior in physical strength to many men. However, uh, men still have the potential, if they put the same work and effort into it, to be more physically superior and more stronger <clears throat> than a female. And I think, you know, th this, this, um, th this comparison that you know this this um uh self comparison kind of phenomenon i think it eats away at women's self esteem uh it, it i mean it would it would affect anybody you know i mean look at what happens like with me i mean you know back in the late 90s early 2000s i used to talk about computer technology a lot because it fascinated me you know that was during the time when i was learning how to build computers and fix and diagnose problems and all that you know i would talk about this stuff in uh in uh, in significant detail, and because I enjoyed it, you know, to me it was interesting. You know, it was the learning process. Look at this catalog. Look at these parts. Look at these, you know, specifications on the parts. Read information on the packaging. Uh, look at the manufacturer's website and and what capabilities they say the product has. And you know, just really, you know, try to discuss it with with people of similar interest and all that. And and talk about it and learn more and think out the whole process of what this technology can do for you. <clears throat> and then people hear me talk about these kinds of things and they hear me talk about them in such significant detail. 
people have told me about this time and time again, you know, and I, I, I notice that there's a self-comparison going on. They, they feel, okay, like my grandpa and other people, you know, they say, you know, they said to me, you know, when when you talk about all these things like like you do, and talk about them as much as you do, and 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 all that, you know, it makes people feel stupid. You know, uh, people feel stupid when they listen to you, and I'm like, really, like, and what it is, I had to figure it out. What it is, it's, you know, I never called these people stupid. I was just talking to you know a friend of mine or whoever who was in the room, I was talking about computers, and then other people so happened to hear it, and <clears throat> there is a comparison going on um, where they compare themselves to me, and they perceive me of being superior um, in, in this situation, which happened to be of, you know, talking about computer, uh, you know, technology, and, you know, electronics, and, and knowledge of computer systems, and, and so forth, uh, so forth. And that these people that were listening, they didn't, they didn't have that, that, um, that, I guess, intellectual capacity, or they felt like they didn't have it, and, I don't know, I guess they felt violated, or whatever, and, or jealous, Wh who knows, you know what I mean? But the point is, they didn't feel good about it, you know, that I had this ability to <clears throat> comprehend this you know, this object of study, which was computer technology. And and it just so happened to be that, you know, because I've talked about other things before, you know, and just it, some people are inspired. Some people like to hear, you know, uh, in-depth discussion about how things function or whatever. And some people enjoy it and they learn and they thrive from it. And... You know, why do you think some people go to college? I mean, obviously the professor ha is in a position of superior knowledge, and then the, the, the college student is of a position of inferior knowledge, but the person, you know, the college student puts themselves through that situation anyway to learn, to benefit. <clears throat> well, there are people who do get jealous because of, basically, I guess they perceive that that they were unfairly dealt a hand of, like, inferior cards. I guess if you're wanting to say that the, 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 the that life is like a card game or whatever. But the point is, they, they resent their inferior situation. And this is just, you know, just a universal human nature thing. However, we see this manifest in women and feminism and especially people like Anita Sarkeesian of Feminist Frequency. I believe strongly uh, that's what she's doing. Um, who cares if there, are, there, if there are more men or more women in video games? What does it really matter? I mean, you know, you're playing a video game and you have to play as a character. You know, like, okay, so the characters in video games are guys. Okay. Or so the characters in video games are women. Okay, now, <clears throat> why do we have to have this big fuss about these kinds of things? Well, Anita Sarkeesian and other people have decided to make a big fuss over it. Now, keep in mind, 35 years ago, with the advent of the early gaming consoles, um, well, even at that time, um, well, I, th I believe it was the Atari 2600, which emerged uh, the second generation of game consoles, uh, there were other game consoles that hmm, didn't really represent, you know, they, well, they didn't really, they're not what we would interpret as game consoles. Mm. Their output devices for display and all that were, <clears throat> were inferior even to the, to the uh, Atari 2600. Um, but... You know, the, the, the Atari 2600 is perhaps one of the first game consoles that, you know, even a modern gamer could even relate with or whatever. Even though, compared to the, you know, the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One, which are on the horizon for being released, perhaps at the end of this year, 2013, or, <clears throat> or whatever, 
where you know you have AMD octa-core processors probably running in a good three gigahertz or whatever. Um, you know they're talking about what is it like eight gigs of RAM or something like that. Usually these consoles never have enough memory. Uh, they have like phenomenally fast processors, but just tiny amounts of memory. I mean, you know that PlayStation Three everybody loves. Yeah, you know. Uh, what is it, like a 3.2 gigahertz um, cell broadband engine? It's basically a single core um, uh, IBM PowerPC. I forgot which version of the power architecture it uses, but um, anyway, I think it's similar to like the, the G3 or G4 PowerPC. Anyway, <clears throat> um. I'll have to look it up again, but anyway, it's a power, you know, IBM Power uh, PC, you know, processor core like what was in the, you know, the Power Mac, and um, and the Nintendo GameCube and the Nintendo Wii and uh, that sort of thing. And what it does is it controls eight synergistic processing elements, which are effectively just stream processors. Um, you know, that that's that's kind of the you know what we have now in modern. Uh, uh, graphics cards since the year 2006, <clears throat> which the year 2006 was uh, <clears throat> a significant leap forward in uh, computer technology. We got out of that stale dark ages of like the Pentium 4 net burst, you know, sync, uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, Microsoft Windows XP. Um, you know, we finally got out of 32 bit uh, computing. Um, you know, finally got off, well, in late 2006, finally got off of Internet Explorer 6, which has held back the Internet for quite a while because it was the default browser that most people had, um, and that sort of thing, and five and a half years of stagnant, uh, or of, uh, you know, stagnant, uh, st halted and stagnated development. Five and a half years, that's like a long time, you know, sort of for technology, and Microsoft chose to stagnate it like that. You know, they achieved their monopoly that they wanted. And just like the Roman Empire, you know, just kind of stagnates and that sort of thing. <clears throat> and, or, you know, the, the effects of the Roman Empire and what it had on Europe whenever it collapsed. Anyway, so then, you know, and, and basically everybody had Internet Explorer 6. And, well, you got to make your web pages look right on everybody's computer. So although the W3C and other entities, you know, had, had really, you know, um, uh, made advancements in, you know, Internet technology and all that uh, for web page technology, well, well guess what? It didn't always, it didn't, it wasn't really practical to use in your websites because everybody was using Internet Explorer 6, which, you know, since, you know, uh, well, introduced in early 2001, and then they didn't, they didn't make any changes, and then they finally introduced Internet Explorer 7 in, like, October of 2006. It's five and a half years of stagnation, so, you know, it, I know, I was developing web pages back then, and... I mean, you had to basically hold yourself back, hold back the, 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 the you know the types of technology that you could use in a web page to accommodate the, the just the stagnation of Internet Explorer six, and it sucked and it was dumb and Microsoft is dumb for doing it, but yet yeah, people seem to trust it. Wow, sounds like that abusive relationship you always hear about, you know. Um, <clears throat> So anyway, yeah, video cards, back to video cards and synergistic processing elements. Now, you know, video cards have, um, well, I got, I'm looking at this computer here, and it's HP MV, um, and it's got, um, what's it got in it, yeah, no, you probably don't want to hear this, but it's got a, um, AMD, well, ATI Radeon, HD 7570, um, Clocked it around 700 and some odd megahertz. Uh, got 480 GPU compute cores. <clears throat> you know, that stream processing, you know, kind of similar in purpose to, you know, uh, in concept to the synergistic processing elements in the cell broadband engine, of which, you know, the, the back to the cell broadband engine, what it does is basically a power PC, you know, IBM power microarchitecture uh, process. Uh, you know, processor core that simply just controls and manages eight synergistic processing elements that really actually do the work. 
you know, the core just uh, of, of the processor really just coordinates everything. <clears throat> Which, of course, the cell broadband engine was used um, in supercomputers such as IBM Roadrunner, but they had thousands of them, though, or well over a thousand. I think they had, like, you know, 1,400 of them or something like that. <clears throat> and it went for an architectural design that, you know, that we enjoy today. Which, you know, in the most powerful supercomputer in the world right now, currently holding the record, um, you know, it's, uh, the, the, the supercomputer is called Titan. Uh, it's owned by the United States, um, the Department of Energy, I believe. It has, um, what is it, 18,688, um, of the AMD uh, Opteron 16 core processors uh, has 32 gigs well okay yeah okay and then it has uh, 18,688 of the um, NVIDIA Tesla K20X model of uh, GPU compute card I believe <coughs> excuse me <coughs> but you know, each each node in this supercomputer, each unit, compute unit, well, whatever you want to call it, it's just a blade server, if you know anything about servers and how they went from the old computer towers to, you know, to a rack-mounted, you know, blade. <clears throat> each blade consists of an AMD uh, Opteron processor, I forget which clock speed, but it has 16 cores, um, and in that blade... Um, you know they have uh, 32 gigabytes of memory, and then they have a NVIDIA Tesla K20X model, I believe, uh, with six gigabytes of uh, of memory. Um, <clears throat> it's only clocked at 700 and some odd megahertz. It's not the fastest card, but it has like, oh my gosh, it's what is it like, like 2,888 GPU compute cores or something like that. Massively parallel processing. And then you, t you take each one of these blades and you have 18,688 of them. Um, so, <clears throat> this thing has terabytes of memory. <clears throat> and, um, Anyway, and this thing usually lingers around, I don't know, like 17 petabytes, you know, it's 17 quadrillion, um, uh, well, no, wait, no, 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 okay, not bytes, but, uh, it, it's around 17, you know, petaflops, it's like around, you know, peta, you know, is for, for, uh, quadrillion, it does, uh, you know, it lingers around 17 quadrillion floating point operations per second, <clears throat> And anyway, I think its theoretical peak is like 27, you know, quadrillion uh, floating point operations per second, you know, 27 petaflops. Um, and it's the world's fastest supercomputer. Anyway, so, yeah, back to the PlayStation 3, you know, so it's got a pretty good processor in it, right? Pretty fast and all that. Well, it's only got 256 megabytes of memory. Um... <clears throat> And PlayStation 3 is also significant for the Condor supercomputer, which, as of last year or whatever, was the 33rd largest supercomputer in the world. It's owned and operated by the United States Air Force. Um, and it consists of, like, what is it, like, 1,300 or, like, whatever uh, PlayStation 3 game consoles sitting on baker's racks with just... A whole bunch of Ethernet cables coming out of them, and then it's coordinated by like a couple different computer systems to coordinate and manage all these PlayStation 3s. <clears throat> and it was done because it was pretty, you know, efficient supercomputing. And, but anyway, um, all right, so, so, like, you know, so, um, yeah, you know, so we, we got these game consoles and all that. And, you know, so back to gaming, you know, women in video games, like, like, why, why does it really have to matter, you know, like, video gaming is a form of escapism, um, as, um, who mentioned that, uh, I think it was HT Arcade, you know, calls himself Arcade, 
<clears throat> he's on YouTube. Um, he mentioned that, and he's right. It is a form of escapism. Okay, and then, um, but, um, you know, I was watching uh, earlier this week, I was watching uh, the, the 1966 Batman, the movie, you know, um, with the uh, Riddler and Joker and Catwoman and Penguin. And, uh, you know, the one that released in 1966 uh, that was akin to the uh, TV series. Anyway, <clears throat> I was watching that, and then I was watching the bonus material um, on the special edition Blu-ray. And by the way, on that movie, the, the uh, you know, the, the picture quality is phenomenal. phenomenal. They really, I mean, for a movie that's more than 40 years old, I mean, they remastered it well. I mean... I mean, obviously, the stuff in the movie looks dated, but, I mean, if you look at the the image quality, you know, on your TV screen, I mean, it, it, it pretty much passed for a new movie now. So, whoever, like, you know, they, they took care of that film when they put it in the vault, and, like, you don't see any scratches or any dirt on the, the film or any, you know, other kind of blemishes or whatever. Not, I've, I've not noticed any of them, you know, any of those types of blemishes in there. <coughs> They took really good care of it. So anyway, I was watching the bonus material, and, you know, these people were being interviewed and, uh, you know, about the movie, you know, who saw it when they were a kid and all that. Um, and they, they mentioned something that really caught my attention. They said that, you know, Batman, uh, that movie and, and the TV series, was such a escapist type of venue for, for, you know, boys at that time, you know, because there's a turmoil of the 1960s. And, you know, the Vietnam War, and, you know, just, you know, chaotic times like that. And, you know, they, they described it like you can escape in the world of Batman. It's all about, you know, being an upstanding citizen and, and fighting crime. And it's like, you know, I don't know, like being a good person or whatever they would say. <clears throat> so, anyway, um, yeah, and I noticed that. See, that word escapist. Uh, came into uh, into my mind uh, my mind again, and um, and it caught my attention because that that uh, corresponds with what H T Arcade had said about video gaming. It is a, a form of escapist uh, medium, and it whole, have always been. Um, and look at how women invaded as such. This gets into why women invaded voting, politics, and all kinds of other male spaces. <clears throat> now, I remember what I was talking about when I was talking about the PlayStation 3. Okay, video game consoles. Okay, back in uh, 35 years ago, with the advent of the Atari 2600 and, um, and all that, nobody really cared about gaming. You know, at that time, back in the 70s, you know, it was about nerds and computer scientists who everybody thought wouldn't, matter, you know, wouldn't amount to anything because they were just wasting their time with circuits, wires, diodes, resistors, you know, electrical formulas, you know, the, 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 the quantization of electrons, you know, through, through a conductive medium. <clears throat> and, for you know, nobody really paid attention, you know, and nobody really cared. Uh, it's just like the, you know, the, the, uh, the personal computer, which, of course, you know, uh, Steve Wozniak, you know, was working on the, the original Apple one, which by attribute was a personal computer. It was a computer that you personally owned and used, but they didn't call it PC. Um, you know, uh, personal computer, uh, you know, Microsoft, you know, really pitched that whole thing, you know, and, uh, and IBM really got that going, you know, calling their, you know, the personal computer, that sort of thing. Of course, you know, Bill Gates just wanted to sell software and make a bunch of money, and, you know, IBM <clears throat> was <laughs> basically coerced into, you know, getting into the personal computer market because, you know, they, they at that time saw no benefit from doing computing at such a, a small individualistic level at that time. You know, their, their, you know, their money came from, you know, for IBM, their cash cow was mainframes um, and... Uh, <clears throat> and uh, terminal systems and that sort of thing. Uh, but, you know, which is something that Bill Gates really had no means of doing anything about. But Bill Gates talked them into, it's like, well, the personal computer, and, 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 and you know, and just, anyway, 
that that's all history. However, you know, it, it's a point in time in which nobody cared about really computer technology except for a a, a, a small segment of society. Uh, the all male. I, mean, I don't know if there was any females involved. I don't know. Now there were females involved in computing back in the 1960s. There was uh, Grace Hopper, who was a admiral, <clears throat> a rear admiral. I think it was two stars. Anyway, I was never in the navy. Um, and um, but she was a you know United States Navy officer uh, in the field of computing. And I'm sure she did their IT. You know the information technology management system, <laughs> probably back before they even called it IT, uh, back before they even had a name for it, and she invented the, the computer programming language known as COBOL, C-O-B-O-L, <clears throat> which basically it was the Electronic Filing Cabinet Computer Programming Language is how I'm going to summarize it, because that's what it did. You know, it, it was a programming language that was very limited in scope. It was, it was a very niche market programming language. You know, it wasn't like C or or uh, or Basic. It wasn't like you know assembly language. <clears throat> um, it, it wasn't like or or more modern things like like Java or Python or Ruby or whatever. You know, it, it wasn't like that. Um, it, it had a very unique application, which is just to you know take basic data. You know records, um, you know, uh, people's names, you know, like, like a person's name, um, a bank account number, uh, a salary income, and just basic, like, like what banks would use. Matter of fact, it was government institutions and it was banks that used COBOL for, for a long time. Uh, <clears throat> but they used it for, you know, like just personal records and company records and that sort of thing and, and basic data like that. And it has to be formula for, it has to be formatted in a very you know a specific way because I used to I used to write a little bit of COBOL in programming class and I mean it wasn't a really hard language to deal with it was just its application was so limited that that that's what would frustrate you you know there's not a whole lot of stuff you can do with it you know I mean you can't I mean like you can't just use it for general purpose programming. <clears throat> Whereas, you know, C, which was invented by uh, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie back in the late 60s, early 70s, when they worked for Bell Labs, um, and get this, you know why uh, uh, the C programming language and its derivatives are so common in computer and video gaming? There's a reason why, because it was invented for that purpose. Um, <clears throat> Uh, these guys, uh, they were basically, you know, they worked at Bell Labs and they had access to mainframes all the time and they were the IT guys there. And, you know, in their spare time they would write little, little simple program, you know, little simple games, you know. Like, I don't know, maybe Snake, you know, Snakes was something that was a little more advanced for them, you know, uh, or for that time period according to, you know, computer hardware com constraints and all that. So anyway, <clears throat> they, um... They, they, you know, at that time, back in the 60s and all that, everything was like assembly language, you know? It's like you had to write in the machine code of, of the microarchitecture for, for the specific, you know, and they, and they were all different, you know? There was no real universal standard. And, you know, so, like, you know, you, you had to know the assembly language of, like, every different machine that you were expect or every different type of machine that you were expected to write a program for, and yeah, that was that was not all that great, <clears throat> and um, and I really like the way the syntax looks for the Intel eighty six assembly language. I mean, it's just it, I like the way it looks, you know. It's just, but it, but it's very different from uh, the assembly language on the Motorola sixty eight thousand, which of course you know that processor is used in the Sega Genesis and a lot of, of uh, arcade machines in the 1980s and the early 1990s, <coughs> of which the Motorola 68000 is still a micro pro uh, microprocessor, despite being a good 30-some-odd years old, it's still a microprocessor that's in use today. Me and my friend were talking about this the other night, you know, phone conversation. We were talking about, you know, the Motorola 68000, uh, also known as the 68K uh, processor, is still used today in gas pumps and credit card terminals. 
along with the Zilog 80, which powered the Pac-Man, the original Pac-Man game, and probably some of the Pac-Man deriv derivatives, such as Miss Pac-Man and all that. <clears throat> Um, this gets into the history of, of, uh, of well, this, this gets more into the history of video gaming and how it ties into computer. Uh, you know, through the history of uh, video games, there have only been a handful of companies that have controlled the hardware, uh, well, that, that have basically, you know, provided the hardware for all game systems. Um, you know, it, 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 I mean, you can probably count all the companies on like one hand, maybe, or at least the micro you know, companies providing the micro -arch micro architecture. You know, of course, the the you know the, the, the fundamental building blocks of the microprocessor and all that. <clears throat> um, let's see, uh, they are Zilog, Motorola, uh, MOS, you know, MOS, um, MIPS, uh, and IBM. And more recently, in the last the last twelve years, I think it was ARM. And um, you know, the the all, your handheld consoles now, pretty much all all your handhelds use ARM uh, uh, ARM um, architecture ARM. It used to represent a Acorn Risk machines. Anyway, uh, like. <clears throat> um, all of the sixth generation game consoles that plug your TV, you know, three main ones, you know, the uh, the, the, the Wii, the, the Xbox 360, and the uh, PlayStation 3, they were all using IBM Power architecture. Um, Sony, for, for, for a while, has used MIPS, uh, in the, you know, MIPS microarchitecture um, in the original PlayStation, the PlayStation 2, and the PlayStation Portable. Um... <clears throat> and then uh, Nintendo has only switched, uh, you know, companies a couple times. They they started out on the Moss sixty five hundred two, which was wildly popular in in the um, in the in the late seventies <clears throat> and through most of the eighties. You know, uh, Moss uh, um, sixty five hundred two microprocessors and their derivatives powered, of course, you know, the the Atari twenty six hundred, the NES. And a derivative of it was in the Super Nintendo, known as the 65C816, but finally named, uh, because it was second sourced, or third sourced, um, you know, it, so it became known as the Rico 5A22, <clears throat> which of course is just a modified version of the Western Design Center, you know, WDC uh, 65C816. Of course, that was... You know, uh, and then that one was a modification of, a, you know, an extended modified version of the original Moss 6502. And um, anyway, <clears throat> so then the Commodore 64 had a Moss 6502 or derivative in it. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if the Coleco had it. It was just, you know, it was just a popular processor in its time. Uh, there were some arcade games that had the Moss 6502 in there. Uh, Moss, uh, some fragments of uh, Moss 65 or Moss 6502 assembly code can be found um, in uh, the first Terminator movie. Whenever you see the Terminator's vision and all that, like we see, like what the Terminator sees, especially when he's like, you know, um, going toward the the motel or whatever. And you see these fragments of what looks like computer code. It's actually assembly language code from the Moss 6502 processor. Uh, it was just a very pro popular processor. Then there was the um, the Zilog 80, like I mentioned, it powered uh, you know Pac-Man and several other games. And then in later systems, um, in uh, you know which it's an 8-bit you know microprocessor, <clears throat> I still use it today. Uh, just you know four years ago. You know, four, four and a half years ago, I, you know, I was taking uh, Zilog 80 processors out of uh, calculators. Um, you know, and I've um, been around for a good 30 years because uh, it's really proven itself. It's a simple architecture and all that. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, um, now, um, although the, you know, processors such as the Motorola 68000 had taken over the gaming industry, well, especially arcade industry, well, the gaming, you know, because arcades, um, whenever it, it took, it taken over, it had taken over as the main CPU that was in a lot of systems, the Zilog 80 was still used, uh, not as the main CPU, but actually as a sound processor. 
uh, almost like a coprocessor and all that. So that in the Sega Genesis, you have a Motorola 68000 microprocessor clocked at 7.61 megahertz. If you're in you know North America for the NTSC, uh, you know formatting and all that. Um, now the Motorola 68000 was a 32-bit processor. At least 32-bit 32-bit inter internally could run 32-bit code or was compatible with 32-bit code. But you know it's cheaper, 16-bit uh, bus, basically limited. <clears throat> you know, its usage to just basically a 16-bit roll. That's why the Sega Genesis, you know, is called a 16-bit system, even though its microprocessor is capable of, of, uh, of operating upon 32-bit code. But I just, I guess for simplicity reasons, they use the, uh, they just use 16-bit, you know, uh, code and 16-bit operations and data and all that uh, for that uh, because, the, you know, its external bus could handle it quite well. And then the, Mo the Motorola, um, 68010, you know, which is just a modified version of it. I believe that was fully 32-bit. It had, you know, 32-bit internals, 32-bit external bus, and of course the uh, Motorola 68020, um, you know, and 030 were, were fully 32-bit. <clears throat> anyway, Sega Genesis has a Motorola 68000 microprocessor, like I mentioned, clocked at uh, 7.61 megahertz. Has 64 kilobytes of memory. Uh, has a Zilog 80 microprocessor for its sound. I forget what it's clocked at, but anyway, um, yeah. And um, then later Sega went with SA with, with like Hitachi, I think, for their SH series of microprocessors. For I think it was a Sega Saturn. It's when they went to 3D, you know, or poly, uh, polygon systems and all that. Because um, now 3D takes a different connotation. It's stereoscopy now. Um, but <clears throat> you know that buzzword of 3D was like so wildly popular for a long time. You know, you don't even know how long. At least for my lifetime. And I'm 33 now. So anyway, <clears throat> um, let's see. Then, um, so then, uh, yeah, and then, uh, and then in the, um, oh gosh, I don't know if it's the SH-1 or the SH-2 that they use in the Sega Dreamcast, I mean the Sega Saturn, then in the Dreamcast, I think it was the SH-4 because it was more three-dimensional, high-performance graphics type of microprocessor, and then Sega got out of the market for hardware, um, of course, in their Game Gear, they used a Zilog 80 processor. In their Sega Nomad, they used the Motorola 68000 processor. Um, you know, these were handhelds. Mm. But anyway, the point is, a handful of companies dominated the hardware for the computer industry throughout its pretty much existence. Now, back to programming languages. <clears throat> um, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, back in, what, 69 or 1970... Uh, you know, they had this dilemma. You know, they had these computer games they spent their time, you know, their free time working on, and they had to basically re totally rewrite the game to run it on a different piece of hardware, like a different computer system or whatever, which sucked for them because uh, they, <clears throat> they had to rethink <clears throat> and re-express what the game's logic and, and what the game's functions and operations are supposed to be. They had to re-express that in another programming language, um... Well, it was, it's still assembly, but, but, you know, different architecture, so a different, different way of going about it, and they didn't like this. So what they did is they invented a universal programming language, and what they did is they invented the C programming language. And it was higher level, and it had some abstract, and it basically, it abstracted from the assembly level, uh, the assembly language level, you know, the, the, uh, <clears throat> the low-level hardware language, or instruction set level, and basically had its own syntax, and they, they just created a syntax for it that, that they decided was going to be universal. And then, that, that was on the, I don't know if you call it the front end of it, you know, like you as the program, you just write your, your, um, your, your program code, uh, yeah, you write your program in this, this you know, type of syntax that they developed, which is called C, and, <clears throat> and, um, then uh, you just write your program, and then you can take that, that program code, and then you can compile it on any system you want. And how they did it was uh, they invented a compiler, which would input the syntax that you wrote that's of a concise type of program, programming language. And then their compiler 
would be familiar with the types of microarchitecture and instruction set language of the, the microarchitecture that you intended to compile your software to run upon. And through this type of abstraction, they, they, uh, <clears throat> they resulted in something that was more universal and applicable across different, you know, uh, platforms and that sort of thing. Um, and so that, you know, you write your program in the C programming language and then it can be compiled on, um, let's say, you know, you can compile it uh, to run on, um, I don't know, a MIPS 4300i. You know what that is? Nintendo 64. Uh, that's the microprocessor in a Nintendo 64. Um, you could compile. You could you could uh, compile it to run on the Motorola 68000, which was like one of the you know Macintosh computers back before they went with the Power PC. Um, you can compile it to run on a. Uh, on a uh, Intel 386, which that means you can run it on FM Towns Marty. Oh, it's some kind of game console, like back in I don't know 89 or whatever, or you know, um, <clears throat> or Next Cube, which I think used a 386 or 486 processor. I forget, but you get the point. Okay, and they invented this, and then this, you know. And, but the C programming language was born out of the need to basically be able to run games on other systems without having to rewrite your program over and over again um, and that sort of thing and now we're to the point in 2013 you know like some 40 years later to where you know a lot of your gaming uh, and just all their applications are written in usually C sharp or some type of extended and derived version of the C programming language of course C++ uh, <clears throat> and where, you know, with C++, they introduced object orientation. With C Sharp, they introduced some features that were kind of unique to the Java programming language. We're not talking about JavaScript, like for the Internet, because JavaScript is actually ECMA script, um, and, and it's something entirely different. We're talking about Java, like, as a programming language, not as, like, a web scripting language. Um, so keep in mind, Java, and then there's JavaScript. Anyway... <clears throat> now, 35 years ago in the gaming market, nobody cared. For, you know, anybody... It, it, it was those nerds and geeks who were just wasting their time with, with twinkling lights and, and, you know, gobs of wires, and they just, well, they'll never amount to anything. Well, you know how them nerds are, and it's, well, them boys, they just waste their time, and murmur, and then... You know, in the late 70s, early 80s of the arcade, it's like, well, them boys, they don't got anything better to do. They, even though they're too lazy to go out and play baseball, Marr, they're in the arcades drinking soda and eating junk food, and, Marr, and wasting all them quarters playing video games, rotting their brains. Marr. And, you know, I remember this stuff even in the late 80s and early 90s, how I was treated, you know, when... <clears throat> My dad got me into video games um, back in 84, 85 with the Intel, uh, or not the Intel, but the Mattel Intellivision, um, which was a 16-bit game console, uh, the first of its kind that I know of that was 16-bit. However, it did not have the type of 16-bit graphics that, that anybody would expect to be 16-bit because what it was, it was a 16-bit CPU, and I've got it right here in my hand. Yep. The fake wood grain on there, the gold colored, all the kind of stuff. And, <clears throat> yes, it was a 16-bit processor clocked at around 3 quarter megahertz. Had, like, I don't know, 2 kilobytes of memory, whatever. But the point is, <clears throat> uh, the games did not look like a 16-bit game. The, re the reason why is because that 16-bit processor had to do, like, everything. Had to, do your gra had to manage your graphics, your input, your sound... Um, other types of operations and stuff like that, and it was just so heavily bogged down and all that. Now, uh, fast forward to the Nintendo NES. Here it is, a an 8-bit uh, microprocessor. It, I think it was it was a derivative. It, ba it was ba okay. When Nintendo Nintendo usually never leaves hardware stock. You know, they 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 never like just use something without modifying it you know, for their microprocessors and their other technology. They've always done this. Um, <clears throat> what they do is they, um, they, 
uh, okay, from the Nintendo NES, they take the MOS, you know, the MOS 6502 microprocessor, wildly popular at the time because it's a pretty efficient and, you know, uh, pretty, pretty, you know, efficient and speedy microarchitecture for its time. And the MOS 6502 was the basis for the RISC microarchitecture, RASC, you know, based on its load, you know, simple load store design for, you know, handling operations. And all that, which influenced the development of the RISC microprocessor or the RISC, you know, RISC, you know, reduced instruction set type of computing that was later used by MIPS and and uh, and and the, the Alpha processor by you know DEC, you know, Digital Equipment you know, Corporation or whatever. Um, you know, it just influenced so many other microprocessors. It was like the fountainhead of like RISC microprocessor design and. <clears throat> And back before there was even such thing as like really risk or anything like that, um, it's just really fascinating. So anyway, the point is, they uh, they they took this microprocessor, the MOS sixty five hundred two, and then they modified it. Like I think they put in some more interrupt timers or whatever, and just you know I don't know V blanking, H blanking, whatever kind of little little low level hardware operation or functionality or whatever. Uh, they had Rico R I C O H, uh, you know that company do this, um, probably on you know using patent, you know a licensed patent or something like that, and then they developed the uh, the two A O three, and that was the final result, and that's what was used in the um, in the um, in the Nintendo NES. Probably they also had Nintendo probably also had Rico add in you know the. the it, the, the freaking lockout chip kind of technology and all that, because <clears throat> Nintendo was anyway was big into that kind of stuff. So anyway, it resulted in the Rico 2A03 microprocessor that is in the Nintendo NES. Okay, it's an 8-bit microprocessor running at I believe it's 1.79 megahertz. Um, but why did it have better graphics than uh, than the 16-bit microprocessor used in the in Mattel Intellivision? Well, the reason why is yes, although it's 8-bit. It's also clocked at roughly about twice the clock rate of the um, of the uh, of the processor used in the Mattel Intellivision, and I forgot the name of the processor because it's not one of the typical ones that was reused by other game consoles and all that sort of thing, like how the MOS 6502 was, or how the Zilog 80, or or the, the Motorola 68000. Anyway. <clears throat> Now, there's another reason why this um, this Nintendo NES, although being an 8-bit system, uh, and it was clocked at double the, roughly about double the rate of the Mattel and television, the reason why it had better graphics is because it had its own dedicated graphics processor, which the Mattel and television did not have. So what it could do is it can offload uh, graphical operations, you know, operations which, and calculations and, and, and data processing, um, that was required to actually display what you would see, it would offload it to a separate entity, which what they call the picture processing unit. Effectively, it's a graphics processor to do the bit blending operations, to do, <clears throat> to actually, um, to actually create the scan lines, blah, 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 all kind of other stuff. Okay. Um, and, um, so anyway, and then I can't remember if it had its own sound processor or not, but anyway, Mm. It abstracted the tasks of dealing with graphics and all that to a separate entity in which the CPU itself could function on you know, running the game. <clears throat> and that's why it being an 8-bit system would still have uh, superior graphics. Hey, check out the TurboGrafx-16. You know what's significant about it? About it? Well, it's got an 8-bit CPU, but it's got a 16-bit graphics processor. Imagine that. And, uh, yeah... And it competed against the uh, Sega Genesis, which, uh, <clears throat> you know, which had a, a, I think it was a superior uh, CPU in it, you know, Motorola 68000, which, oh my gosh, the Motorola 68000 was in a lot of my favorite arcade games uh, from the late, eight, you know, starting from the mid-80s on up to the early 90s, you know, back, around, what, 86 through 93, um, you know, the Ninja Turtles arcade game, the first, and I believe the second one, you know, or the first one in 1989, which is amazing. Anyway, the X-Men arcade game in 1992, <clears throat> if you ever play MAME, you know, the multiple arcade machine emulator, 
You'll notice these details about it because it tells you what it's emulating. It tells you what pieces of hardware that it's emulating and then you, you get to find out screen resolution. Um, you get to find out, you know, what CPU and, and other co-processors was in the equipment and it's just in the original equipment because after all it has to emulate it so it has to know what it's what what pieces of hardware that it's emulating. It's really fascinating. <clears throat> anyway, okay. Now back in that time, you know, when I was, you know, when my dad got me started in gaming, and he was in his 30s at, at that time, um, at the time he got me into video gaming, he was about roughly the age that I am now. This is back in the early to mid 80s, and um, anyway, he had got me into video gaming because he had got into video gaming, and it was great. Uh, <clears throat> My dad went to electronic school and all that, which I never did, but uh, he went to RETS, you know, R-E-T-S, you know, the one you always hear about, on, well, the one you used to hear about on TV and all that all the time, and it was like, I don't know, some kind of good electronic school or something like that, and uh, yeah, it was pretty cool, and at one time I had his book, his manual there. and it's just the way that the pages were bound in there. It wasn't like a typical book. Um, anyway, so, oh, I would love to have that book of his, and I might be able to get it from him, because I mean, obviously he, don't do it, he doesn't do it anymore, uh, electronics. So, uh, <clears throat> anyway, maybe I ought to go to Red's. Anyway, so, uh, 
So, like, later on, you know, in the late 80s and early 90s, when I was, you know, focusing more on video gaming and all that, because that's when he really started to emerge, um, you know, as its viable commercial entity, of which Nintendo bought, or Nintendo brought video gaming back from the brink of annihilation and destruction and just, you know, <clears throat> the video game crash of 1983, because apparently all the ideas had been done already, and that sort of thing, um... And to the point in which, you know, the the market was beginning to, to, to see some saturation from clones. You know, clones of games and all that. And stagnation, everybody lost interest in late 1983. And the bottom of the market dropped out. And right around that time is when Nintendo invented the Famicom back in, uh, you know, in Japan. And then it took a little more than a year to catch on over here, or to actually make its way over here to America. It was wildly popular in about the span of... Two years from the time of the video game crash, then everybody was like, it's this new renaissance era of video, uh, era of video gaming. As a matter of fact, I'm looking at some posters on my wall uh, from that time period right there. Now you're playing with power. You know, the Nintendo posters and all that that used to come with the games and the game systems. Anyway. Um, yeah, and um, so anyway, you know, my, when I was starting to get bad grades in school because I'd rather play video games than to do my homework. You know, even my dad, who got me into video games, said, you just sit on your ass all the time. Just like, so you, all you want to do is play video games. You're getting bad grades in school. Man. And it's like, yeah. And he, But anyway, the early time of video game history, first of all, it was just for scientists, nerds, and geeks, and the undesirables in society. It's like, yeah, we want all these scientific discoveries all these people are making, you know, the types of work that all these technicians are doing, but, yeah, you know, we don't really care about them. We just like, oh, look, he's a geek, he's a nerd, he's he's unvalidated, he can't score a chick. Meh. You know, what good is he? Meh. Well, we can at least rely on his technology. You know, they think about him like he's like a member of the slave class or whatever, you know? I mean, that, that's sort of the kind of vibe you pick up on that sort of thing. So back in the early days of video gaming, nobody cared. You know, and it was men. Only men. Men were the prominent people doing it. You know, now I'm sure these companies employed some women, but I mean, the scientists, the engineers, the technicians, yeah. Who were they? Men. The point is, men did this because men were the only ones that took interest in it. <clears throat> and, you know, like I mentioned, Ken Thomas and Dennis Ritchie, they were system administrators at Bell Labs back in 1969, 1970, and so forth, uh, managing information technology equipment, managing all this stuff for a major telecom company. And all that, and they basically, you know, they were not the first person who wrote video games. There was, the history goes back even further, back into the 50s and all that. It was simple type of gaming that would be attempted on an oscilloscope, which, you know, you see that making the wavy lines, you know, according to, like, you know, sound and whatever. <clears throat> anyway, you know, uh, scientists and technicians were, were the first people to create these electronic games. And all that, and it was a slow developmental evolution, um... Until the late 70s when, hard, when, when computer hardware became more powerful enough in which to do these types of things. Um, you know, uh, Nolan Bushnell, I think it was, of Atari got involved and, you know, well, you, you all can look up what he did, you know. He kind of really emerged the video game industry. But it was men. Men were the only people that really took interest in it. Men were the only ones that really had any aptitude. You know, women were just playing with dolls and putting on makeup and trying to score with guys and... You know, and, and, you know, shouting, I am woman, hear me roar, and all this stupid crap, while men were inventing the video game industry as actually a spinoff of the computer industry. It was a separate spinoff <clears throat> and an emerging entity. And it was just a little niche market, no I paid any really attention to it, that's the point. And then, um, in the early 1980s, um, the profitability be, uh, of, of, uh, of gaming began to be noticed. And here's the thing. Here is why the computer industry threw its full weight and support into video gaming. And the reason why, you want to know that mystery? That, that You want to solve that puzzle? Because it was the video game industry that sold computer hardware. Yeah, they're game designers, you know. They're, they're basically hardware salesmen is what they are, you know, because they, they have these, you know, these computer or these game designers have ideas in their head <clears throat> and they want to create games and whatever. 
Well, what they need to do is, you know, their games, you know, their ideas push the envelope of what the hardware is capable of at the time, which creates demand upon these computer hardware companies to actually make more powerful hardware to keep up. The point is, the computer hardware industry turns a profit from it. Okay? In the 80s, you know, the gaming becomes more commercially viable. You know, it takes notice of the computer industry. Well, I mean computer industry. I'm not talking about, like, IBM, per se, or whatever. I'm talking about Zilog. I'm talking about Motorola. I'm talking about, you know, uh, Moss. I'm talking about Western Design Center. You know, well, <clears throat> you know, I'm talking about MIPS. I'm talking about, you know, um... Uh, you know, all this stuff. Well, look at the lumber industry. Look at, look what these arcade machines are made out of. Plywood, you know? Uh, look at the plastics industry, for, you know, for the game consoles. All these kinds of things. Even the television industry uh, benefited from it, you know? Um, the point is, it becomes a, you know, because people become interested in these fascinating games and all that, it just stimulates growth in an industry. Okay... Fast forward to the early 1990s with Super Nintendo, Sega Genesis, and you know the emergence of 16-bit uh, and then 32-bit gaming, and, and the, the enthusiasm, the enthusiasm of compact disc uh, <clears throat> as a storage medium. I still got a bunch of these Nintendo Power magazines and, from that time period, and it was just. It was like the utopian dream, compact disc, 32-bit microprocessing, Man, more realistic experience, you know, break the bottlenecks of I.O., you know, and just, anyway, so, going on, um, then the, the, the gaming industry, as it grew, it attracted more people, and then became the, uh, <clears throat> Uh, girls started getting getting into games, and nobody stopped them at first. Who cared to stop them? It was just, oh, you know, girls all, all of a sudden start taking notice. Whenever the industry got more commercialized, and then I remember I got, you know, the Nintendo Power magazines from the early 1990s, and, you know, where they started including, you know, they started making games specifically for girls. A few of those games at the time were The Little Mermaid, um, and, um, I've played it before, and actually the graphics on it for a Nintendo NES game are not bad. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, <clears throat> so anyway, and, you know, I remember my dad had, like, when he went to the, the, the video store, it's like, now make sure you rent a game for, for your, you know, for, for, uh, for, for your daughter, you know, I'd like, it's just that kind of scenario occurred, like, well, make sure you... You know, it's like, rent, my dad was told to rent a game that my sister would like, you know. It's like, well, be fair to her. Rent one for her. So that's how I found out about The Little Mermaid. Okay, now I got the Nintendo Power magazines from the early 1990s, and they got Barbie, Game Girl. Man, I could probably almost tell you what, what issue of Nintendo Power it was in. I think it was in... Uh, I don't know, June or July of 1992. Uh, matter of fact, I'll just go in my closet and while I'm talking to you, uh, Mr. Repzion and whoever cares to listen, um, I'll look, uh, speculate which uh, issue it was in. Volume 37. Okay, on the cover is Lemmings. Over the Edge of Excitement. Krusty's Funhouse feature. Man. Uh, June 1992, it was uh, volume 37, uh, let's see, what was in there? Oh, what I see, Metroid 2, Return of Samus, on page 46, Samus Aran, and, you know, it's like, <clears throat> yeah, girl, get, you know, a, a female role, but, oh, she's all cool, because you don't know she's female, because, for all you know, she's androgynistic. You know, Sarkeesian's talked about that kind of stuff, too. That gets in another aspect of the female mind. You know, this whole androgyny thing. And that's why, um, you know, Anita Sarkeesian gets all pissed off at, you know, uh, chicks in games that have, like, big tits and all that. Because, well, you want to know the secret? It's basically, women are so jealous of other women. Okay, it's not in this one. Uh, it's just for Game Boy. It's like Metro 2, Star Wars, and NBA. Okay, try again. Set down the recorder. Um, 
volume, let's try volume 38. All right. With uh, Street Fighter 2 um, uh, featured on the cover, Nintendo Power's Password Giveaway, Volume 38, July of 1992. Let us look. And 1992 is like my favorite year from um, Nintendo Power. Okay, now for Game Boy, it's just got to Toxic Crusaders, Jeep Jamboree, Wave Race, and Centipede. I know it's in here somewhere. Um, let's look at Volume 36, which is May 1992. Probably my favorite uh, issue of Nintendo Power ever. First one I got in the mail in 1992, because of when I started my subscription. Uh, okay, featuring Darkwing Duck on the cover. Actually, I got two of these. Um, okay, now what do we see here? No, it's not in the table of contents. It's got Batman, 4-in-1 pack, and then the Workboy, which is basically a little personal computer thing uh, for the Game Boy. And... Basically, it turned into vaporware. It was never produced. Oh, gosh. Where's the volume? Okay, volume 39, which is August of, two th or August of 1992, featuring Mario Paint on the cover. And... Damn, like, where is this stuff? Maybe I'm going to have to, like, look at my other... Um, well, let's look at volume 41, which is uh, Super Mario Kart, uh, October of uh, 1992. Oh, crap, where is it? I know it's here. I know it's here somewhere. Um, let's go in the other room. <clears throat> um, I know it's got to be in here somewhere. Alright, where are my other Nintendo Power magazines? Oh, come on. Ah, here they are. Okay. Um, September 1992, volume 40, uh, featuring Felix the Cat on there. Ah, here it is. I found it. All right, I found it. Okay. Uh, yep, uh, for the Game Boy, in this issue of Nintendo Power, they feature the Jetsons, uh, Dr. Franken, Kingdom Crusade, and Barbie, colon, Game Girl! Man! Alright. Now, oh, Prince of Persia for Nintendo NES. Yeah, everybody thought saying his time was like, or whatever, the one on PlayStation, uh, PlayStation 3, they're like, wow, you see that Prince of Persia game, and like, that was some people's first introduction to Prince of Persia. yeah. September 1992, uh, volume uh, 40 of Nintendo Power featuring Felix Cat on the cover. Yeah, it's got it on here. It's got Prince of Persia. Uh, starts on page 14 of Nintendo Power, goes on up through, and the graphics look great for the time. It's actually supposed to be based on the PC game of like the late 1980s or early 1990s. Uh, ends on page 19 here. All right. Um, now, let's see. Um, okay, ah, here it is, page 62 of volume 40, which is September uh, of 1992, issue of Nintendo Power, Barbie, Game Girl, uh, Barbie is trademark of Mattel Incorporated, copyright 1992, Mattel Incorporated, copyright 1992, high-tech expressions, which I guess that was the game publisher, um, yeah, okay, here's what it says in this, this issue here. Fresh from her success on the NES, the popular heroine, Barbie, is making waves on, on Game Boy with Barbie Game Girl from High Tech Expressions. Barbie is on a search for the perfect outfit at the Fantasy Mall, <laughs> but her adventure is far from just a fashion show. Her somersaults over obstacles, power walks through packs of enemies and swims the seas as a mermaid in seven action pack stages. Barbie Game Girl is a solid game with a theme and a difficulty level suited for players uh, who may not find games such as Operation Sea or Double Dragon up their alley. Between levels, there's a match game which allows players to take a break from the action and rake in bonus points. <clears throat> Okay. Uh, <laughs> yep. 
And yeah, it's uh, okay. Page one is on 62, page two is on 63, and they only have two pages of it. Well, I bet Anita Sarkeesian is going to take issue with that. Well, the game doesn't have representation of women properly. They only dedicated two pages to the game. Meh, meh. Furthermore, it just relegates women to the role of shopping objects. Meh. I can just imagine what Anita Sarkeesian is going to say about that. I mean, I can almost just insert words into her mouth because I know the formulaic mindset in which she, like, focuses upon or, or dwells or whatever. point is, <clears throat> Mr. Repzion and, and the audience here, you need to understand some things about female nature, and I've just rambled on for well over an hour um, about these kinds of things. Um, anyway, um, the gaming industry did not attract women until it became successful. Okay, commercially sex successful. Men built it up. Uh, well, this is just like a building or a house. Okay, in the beginning... Um, it is a man uh, who is the architect, usually, of a building or whatever, or just a foreman on a construction site or whatever the case may be. Okay, it is men who do the construction work, you know, dig the ditches, uh, dig for the foundation, pour the concrete to become the foundation, lay the infrastructure, <clears throat> lay the bricks or blocks, pour the concrete, build the frame, do all that kind of stuff. And then comes in a woman, after the building's finished, to be the interior decorator. This tells you about female nature. Now, there are some women who do like to take, take risks, but they are the exception to the rule. Um, I feel like when I study the female mind, I feel like I am studying a serial killer. Now, I'm not saying that women are serial killers, but it's like you always hear about, like, that FBI expert, you know, it, like the Bureau, who's like, who specializes in tracking serial killers that are so elusive to the police. Meh. Anyway, <clears throat> so it's kind of like one of those kinds of things. Um, so, um, anyway... This tells you something about the female. Okay, women say that they want equality, but they actually don't. They want an equality of outcome. They don't want an equality of treatment. Okay, when they say equality, they just use the general term. They say equality, and then everyone assumes an equality of treatment. However, what women want is actually an equality of outcome. <clears throat> equality of outcome. And there's a difference. It's kind of almost like justice and mercy within religious systems. Um, there is a differential between it. One cannot, you know, um, one cannot be satisfied unless it's at the expense of the other. <clears throat> because there's a difference between the entities. This gets back to what I was talking about originally, how men and women took developmental, uh, you know, different developmental paths throughout history. Okay. And women, okay, you gotta understand, women see the world through a lens of how it affects them, how it makes them feel. Um, men oftentimes see the world through a lens of, like, what is expected, what needs to be done. <clears throat> this goes into how men and women were, you know, how, how they were raised and treated throughout history. Uh, Girl Rights What could tell you about this. Um, and I'm sure Stardust can tell you also. And that cynical cynicism could... Uh, could uh, educate you about this. The point is, <clears throat> I know I rambled on and on about stuff in detail. I, I do this. I, to I topic branch a whole lot, and then, you know, various levels of detail. Anyway, back to the original thing. <clears throat> you see these common denominators in which women invade male spaces. This is why I call them Space Invaders. And yes, it is a reference to video gaming, yes. I mean, you know, you, you hear the title of Space Invaders, you know, you're thinking about invaders from space. No, I'm expressing it as invaders of space. And this is why I mentioned the Batman movie, you know, from 1966, you know, the, the escapist kind of thing. And then, of course, you know, well, we got to have, like, a female like, hero or something. Bad girl! Why? You know, why can't a dude just go fight crime? Why does he got to have a female companion? You always see this. <clears throat> this gets into the larger picture of society. Once the... Um, the uh, I'm just building up all these things, and I had to give you these components of information so you can build the larger picture. You know, I had to give you some puzzle pieces so you can assemble it and see what the puzzle is supposed to be. Anyway, so... 
Onward. Uh, okay, let's go back to the economy. Oh, well, no, well, the society and prosperity and all that. Once society became prosperous, prosperous enough, and you know, and then people could be liberated from the burden of like daily life of working on the farm, basically struggling for their very own existence, you know, building their own houses from cutting down timber themselves, and like living like the Amish people do, or like whatever. <clears throat> Once prosperity. And technology and all this had had emerged in which it benefited more people. Then you start noticing women uh, uh, coming on board for things, and it almost reminds me of electrical induction. Um, you know, when just like how capacitors work. I mean, you know, like um, you know, if you get two electrical components close enough to each other, the electrons will try to jump across and traverse the distance, and. <clears throat> That's what it kind of reminds me of. And uh, so once prosperity emerged, uh, and, and it caused daily life to be easier to deal with, you know, you didn't have to walk all the way out in the middle, you know, you didn't have to walk 20 miles in the snow to get somewhere. You could take the bus. You know, those examples of how life got easier. Then you see women want to get involved. And the reason why I mention this is because it, it, it shows a key psychological component of the female mind. Now, this is universal human things. However, men are still, in a way, almost like oppressed and relegated to the roles of protector, provider, and a very servile type of lifestyle in comparison to what the female, you know, tries to obtain for herself. You know, whenever... Whenever... <clears throat> Uh, a woman is in a, a a servile, you know, like a very servitude role. You know, she whines and moans about, her, "Oh, I'm oppressed. I have to make, I have to make his meals, and I have to cook his food, and I have to wash his clothes, and I have to have, I have to take care of his children. Oh, I'm so oppressed. And, man, man, it's so hard to deal with. And what it is is it basically speaks to the selfish desire desire to to be accommodated. You know what I mean? Like, it's like. You know, everybody, sure, a lot of people would like to have something for free and all that, but how many people actually get to obtain it? It's kind of like that. You know, okay, here's another way to express it. <clears throat> look at customer interactions. Um, look at what happens in the business. Uh, let's say fast food or retail or, or something that that most people would come in contact with. Well, what you see is there is a hypo agency on the on behalf of the customer uh that is granted to them by the business the 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 you know the uh the the, the restaurant the 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 retailer the uh, the gas station whatever the case might be there is a hypo agency uh afforded to the customer um and in order to in order to facilitate that type of a treatment there has to be a hyper agency of the employee this is why in a fast food restaurant employees are expected to just bow and scrape and just bend over backwards and they are expected to just you know sacrifice so much for the satisfaction of the customer same thing within retail and what it is is the customer, you know, they've got the power to go somewhere else and spend their money elsewhere. Man, you know, you always hear about that. You know, you're always told by your supervisor, don't run off another, don't run off a customer. Man, one customer. Wow, don't run off one customer, huh? Because there's always a risk. Well, they could tell other customers, and that'd be bad for business because then everybody will believe it. Man, and, you know, it's like... And what happens in that type of scenario or that type of, uh, of job field is almost exactly what happens in gender, um, you know, uh, you know male-female interactions. The female is the customer. The male is the employer, the, the business entity, the, um, <clears throat> the worker. And this reminds me of Aesop's Fables and... You know, Ayn Rand's book, well, I mean, Aesop's Fables of the Ant and the Grasshopper, and um, also Ayn Rand's book titled uh, Atlas Shrugged. Uh, you know, the, you know, one entity benefits 
at the expense of the other is a common theme, or whatever the case may be, however you want to express it. I really need to articulate and elaborate on it better. But, <clears throat> like, okay, look what goes on at a fast food restaurant. You know, uh, um, the, the Amazing Atheist <laughs> really described this well in uh, one of his videos um, about Big Red, you know, that red, you know, that fake neon red hair feminist, uh, you know, uh, gynocentric hate mongering bigot. Um, which is known as Big Red, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, t uh, the amazing atheist was talking about, you know, how a, a person will go in a fa in, in a restaurant and order the extra mustard on their sandwich, <clears throat> and then whenever their sandwich is 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 prepared and made and given to them by the employee, then the customer gets all mad, throws the sandwich down, and says, I said no mustard, <laughs> man! You know, and then, um, and then pretends to be horribly betrayed and shocked and dissatisfied and basically playing the role of a victim. And what type of victimhood is this? Well, I didn't get what I was paying for. I didn't get what I was supposed to get. <laughs> man! So then what they try to do is, you know, it all, it functions like a form of robbery because they they're trying to get the employee and the management basically the business to give them a desirable situation um by giving them more food or free food or extra coupons or whatever would accommodate you know the the the, the customer's sense of entitlement self entitlement okay <clears throat> you see this all the time in restaurants uh, it happens every day, sometimes multiple times per day. It's sad, and we all, and the rest of us, we all have to pay a higher price, you know, so that that business can be profitable. All so some people can get what they want. Man. You know, it's very, very selfish, very low and disgusting. The type of person who would do such a thing. You notice the psychology of them. Very, very self-centered. And who would be like that? I don't know. Maybe they feel just emptiness inside for why. And maybe that's what motivates them. You know, it's like, you know, why do they feel the need to have so many things accommodate them? You know, it's like, I'm... I understand, at least, I, I understand it at least in part, but it's like... What really, <clears throat> you know, I'm trying to really dig deep and understand what, you know, the, the fine details of what, anyway, anyway. So you see how that goes on. And, you know, the customer, you know, the, the, the employees are supposed to follow the rules and do everything and, and satisfy the customer and, and, you know, provide what the customer wants. And then, and then the customer can just leave trash all over the table and, act stupid and probably even break things maybe it just depends it just depends on how the management there handles the situation and all that and the customer can be very unruly very selfish very destructive and all that and more or less they will get rewarded uh, now if your business is a very very independent family owned very local small business then the business owner can be like hey customer you shouldn't act like that Mah. You know, can make that kind of decision. But if it's some kind of a franchise operation with a corporate entity and all that, where there's so much of a large chain of command and all that, then it's like, you know, there's this fear in order to, like, you know, resort to, like, you know, it's like the most basic instructions. You know, keep the customer happy. Because you don't want to get fired, buddy. And um, so even, a, you know... Um, even a manager, you know, a shift manager or a location manager, you know, in charge of the whole building or whatever, will still just completely submit to a, you know, selfish, obnoxious customer. Um, because there's always more people up the ladder who could fire this manager or this employee or whatever the case may be. It's like, and, and see, customers, they know how to do this. They, they understand it very well. You know, they, they try to complain to the highest ranking person they can to create the illusion that the problem was so egregious, so egregious, so horribly bad that it just had to go up that up to that level. You know, it's like I remember when I used to do security in a nearby city <clears throat> at a museum, 
and here's this old guy, <clears throat> probably in his 60s or 70s or whatever, and, um, and you know, he paid to see the IMAX movie, um, you know, but he didn't pay to see the museum exhibits. And, you know, so he paid the fee to, to, um, to go into um, the, the IMAX movie, um, and then the, the price for admission into the museum and then the price for the IMAX movie were the same. They were $9 at that time in 2005, and now for $12, you can get both. See, that's the thing. For 30% more, you can do both, you know? So it was an excellent value. The, the, the guy should have paid the extra $3, but he didn't want to. He thought, well, I can just pay the $9 for the movie and then sneak into the museum. So what he did is <clears throat> uh, he tried to sneak in and all that, and he had the excuse of, well, i got to follow my, my grandson. He just, you know how kids are. They just run into places, you know. It's like, well, you know, and, well, anyway, the, the kid had got through and all that, and then I stopped the guy because I noticed the guy. He was bigger. And uh, I, I said, sir, you know, uh, like, you know, uh, you know, it's like I need to see your ticket. You know, he's like, and I need to make sure that he that he was authorized, you know, to go into that area and make sure that he paid for it and all that. And he's like, well, my grandson just run through here and like, you know, it's like if I lose him, if I can't find him, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to have your job and then I'm going to own you. Oh, man, he was so rude. And all that. So, okay, I just threw up my hands and let the guy go through and find the kid, right? Well, after the crowd cleared out, you know, went down the stairwell and all that, and everything returned to normal, because, <clears throat> you know, the movie had just got out, uh, had just released, uh, I mean, just, you know, um, just finished, and then the crowd was, you know, leaving the theater. So anyway, I, you know, walked through the museum like I was supposed to do, and, you know, I seen this guy looking at the exhibits. Well, he found his grandson. The grandson was standing right next to him. They are both looking at the exhibits and all that. And I stood there for a couple of minutes just silently and watching it and waiting for this guy to have a conscience and leave the area, you know, since he didn't pay for that. And he, you know, he kept looking, glancing over and noticing me. Then about a minute or two later, he says, Are you going to stand there forever? Are you going to leave us alone? <laughs> and I'm like, you didn't pay to be in this part of the museum. You know, it's like, you need to pay to see the exhibits. He's like, and then he gets all pissed off and stuff like that. And he's like, you know, I told him, it's like, you're, you're either going to have to go downstairs to the service desk and pay for the movie, or you're going to have to leave. You know, he's like, oh, he got all mad, you know. So he starts walking toward the stairwell, and I have to follow him because I had to get down toward that part of the museum at that time of the hour anyway. <clears throat> and that's what my job calls for. And this guy was all pissed off, and he's like, He's like, and you're following me. Man. I'm like, I have to get down to the bottom level, and this is the closest set of stairs. You know, so I followed him. Plus, I had to make sure he went down there also. So he starts going down there, and the little fucker, he, like, he stands on the very last step before he touches the floor. He turns around, and he looks at me, and he says, Is this far enough, or do you want me to go the rest of the way? I just looked at him. I was so pissed, and I just stared into his eyes. And then he like leaned up a little more and tried to intimidate me or whatever. And then he just turned around <clears throat> and he walks out that way. He walks into the main lobby and then he he looks and glances at the at the exit for like a few seconds. Then he turns and looks in the other direction at the customer service desk. Uh, customer service desk. It's almost like he announced his his entry into the the area because. He looked over the customer service desk and he said, Oh, I think I'll go over here. And <clears throat> he, was, he was making it excessively obvious. So then, uh, you know, he goes over to the service desk and he says, Well, oh, I need to talk to your manager. I mean, chairman of the board. Yeah, he, he interrupted himself then to say chairman of the board. Oh, like I was supposed to be afraid of this asshole and his whole, like, just anyway, <clears throat> he goes over there and says, like, I need to talk to your chairman of the board. And they're like, well, we don't have a chairman of the board. We have a director and all that. And, and he, you know, he's like, well, I need to speak to that person. Well, it's the time of day. They weren't there anyway. And they just had some managers there. And uh, so the customer, you know, so the, you know, the, the, the customer service desk person, you know, gave the contact information or whatever. And then, you know, the guy, he's like, he eventually left. But the point is, you know, that's, that's a selfish, entitled customer for you. 
And although this guy was, you know, in this situation was a man, there's been lots of other women who do it also. The point, it's, the, my point is it's human nature to be selfish like that. However, when a man is selfish, he's usually shamed for it. And then a woman tries to escape shame a whole lot, you know, like uh, the disposable human doing. You know, a friend of mine, he came over last night and uh, was, uh, he had finished watching uh, the Green Berets on Blu-ray that I let him borrow, <clears throat> which is a movie that came out in 1968. I think it was the only movie that actually came, that was actually filmed and released during the Vietnam War. Uh, so, so it's so in terms of equipment and scenery, you know, it's very accurate. You know, it's not like they had to like afterward like try to go find a bunch of vintage helicopters to match the time period. No, they just used the current helicopters that were in field use, and then. You, Anyway, <clears throat> and uh, it was a very good movie and all that, if you like war movies and all that. And um, so anyway, there's a scenario where, like, the guy ca in that movie, they got to capture the general. And it's like, we got to capture this guy. Man. And, like, anyway, and they, and they use this woman to basically function as, like, a prostitute to, you know, to, like, you know, to distract this guy. And then the Green Berets come in and abduct him, you know. And it's like, and the girl didn't even get to have sex with him, you know. It's like, you know, she's just taking off her clothes, and like, by the time she even gets onto the bed, here come the Green Berets, and the Green Berets, and storm the place, and capture, you know, the, you know, the the uh, the North Vietnamese general, and all that, and like shoot up all the guards and all that. So anyway, <clears throat> like later on, like after they airlifted that uh, that uh, North Vietnamese general and all that, and he's totally captured, and you know, and all that. Then, like, you know, and then, uh, like, the, um, you know, the Green Berets and the, the South Vietnamese, you know, personnel, like, they're trying to escape the area and all that. And, uh, the one, the one woman, you know, is like, you know, the Vietnamese woman that's like, I don't know, a cousin or whatever to this one brother of this South Vietnamese officer or whatever. You know, she's sitting there, she's like looking all frustrated, like, mm -hmm. you know, she's like, she's basically like, everybody's going to think I'm a whore, mm -hmm. I'm going to be shamed for, she didn't even have sex with a guy, you know what I mean? It's like, but she's worried about, like, mm -hmm. everybody's going to think I'm a tramp, mm -hmm. and then, then the, the South Vietnamese officer or whatever, I think he was like a general or a colonel or whatever, the one that's like, whose brother is, like, married to this this Vietnamese woman that was functioning like a prostitute. And, you know, and uh, and then so the South Vietnamese guys were like, you know, he's like, he's like, you you did an honorable service for your country. I, I'm proud of you. Man. And the girl, like, all of a sudden instantly smiles, like, oh, you mean it? Oh, wow, okay, I'm not a whore. Oh, wow. That's not what she said, but that's basically a, 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 a you know, exaggerated, articulated form of, like, what happened. And to, to get the point across, do you know what I mean? And so anyway, I mean, this is a thing. It's like women are allowed to be the way they want, and they have very little restraint. Uh, now, men, on the other hand, in comparison have to be subjected to the things that women don't want to be subjected to. Now, it's not complete, absolute, 100%, but it's more of all, more or less, a general way in which how things function, you know? Anyway, uh, if you understand female nature and all that, and understand its historical context and how it basically created feminism, then it's no surprise that Anita Sarkeesian emerges in this time period and does and says what she does. And I mentioned earlier the adamantium horse of like monopolistic victimhood and all that. It's, you know, of like, well, women get beat up and well, women get mugged and well, women get raped and well, m women get discriminated against and well, well, you know, women get killed and well, well women are meh and and, meh and meh. It's an adamantium horse. I mentioned adamantium because that instruct, you know, indestructible metal, you know, there, there was Wolverine's skeleton and his claws and all that. It's indestructible. It cannot be destroyed or, or like, or altered or, like, damaged or, like, whatever. And that, that's how, you know, you always hear about beating the dead horse. 
well, this horse must be made out of adamantium or something because they just keep kicking it and beating it and beating it. And you would think that by now it would turn into like some bloody gelatinous goo from like, you know, or like totally deteriorate and decompose and like, you know, and be like fly food by now. But apparently not. It must be made out of adamantium or something. You know, it's just an expression, you know. Because they keep doing it, they keep doing it, it's like they just keep kicking the horse and it won't turn to mush, you know? It's like, more victims, because we're victims, more victims, give us the stuff we want, because we've been victimized, man, you know, just like an angry customer, you know? And that's why I mentioned that kind of stuff before, and it's a way for women to get what they want. And women will portray themselves as the weaker, more feeble entity if it gets them what they want. Now, on the other hand, if it also gets them what they want, they'll portray themselves as strong and independent and, and they will flip-flop so much because the common denominator is they want to obtain what they think will satisfy them. Okay? Now, you want to piss off a woman, I tell you what, just give her what she says she wants because she will never be happy. She is unsatisfiable as an entity. You know, the psychology of a person like that. And see, that's the thing. So many of the darkest, selfish, destructive attributes of the human mind are actually manifest in the female. Now, I am absolutely going to tell you that, that it, can, it, it can manifest in the male also. I mean, look at the, the stuff that Hitler did, you know. Nobody's going to dispute that. It's unique, okay, it's universal human nature, you know, to let fear drive you into destructive tendencies or just, you know, selfishness and victimize other people. It's a human thing. However, there are, there is a system or a framework um, or a series of cultural taboo management systems that more or less keep men in check from behaving that way. And you got to know what they are. However, there's not really that system so much to, you know, uh, suppress women's destructive nature. Um, now, I'll, tell, I'll tell you, the biggest source of misogyny in this world actually comes from women. Uh, now, you, you, whenever you hear men call women sluts, actually, they're just regurgitating the same things that women spew. You know, you always hear about male jealousy, you know, in competition like that. Well, females do it too, <clears throat> in some ways, if another female stands as an obstacle in the way of what a particular female wants to achieve. Then that female that wants to achieve something can be quite brutal. Um, you know, I mean, it, to, to or not, you know, can be quite brutal to another female. You know, I mean, and we see this in the fashion industry with all this androgyny that, that Rocking Mr. E talked about. And I know that, you know, in the circles of elite, you know, uh, the circles of MGTOW, you know, kind of, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, um, spaces and all that with, and I'm a man going my own way, and, uh, and, you know, that, that it's like, um, what was I mentioning, uh, circles of big toe, um, yeah, yeah, okay, in the circles of MGTO, you know, people and, and just the groups or whatever, uh, um, you know, Rocking Mr. E is not really popular, you know, because there's there was this clash between Rocking Mr. E and Barbarossa and, and uh, Rocking Mr. E and Stardust and then Rocking Mr. E and that cynical cynicism and all that. Um, but Rocking Mr. E, I'm going to defend him by saying that he has made some important and significant contributions to understanding the gen the gender problem. <clears throat> now, uh, there is times when he'll get frustrated at MGTO or whatever, but still, overall, Rocking Mr. E brings something of benefit to the table, and that's why I am defending him. 
um, gosh, you know, there is the potential for me and Rocking Mr. E to have our own clash. But it hasn't happened yet. Um, you know, he keeps a cool head about stuff. I keep a cool head about stuff regarding him. He, anyway, we haven't clashed yet. <clears throat> and, um, you know, in the event that, you know, him and I have a disagreement or clash, and when tell him, it's like, buddy, you know, it's like, I respect you a lot. I admire your contributions. Uh, you know, I couldn't have even developed my, my you know, theories or teachings uh, about evolutionary showdown and all that if it wasn't for some of the contributions that Rocking Mr. E made. But I'll tell him, it's like, buddy, you know, like, you... it's like, if we're going to turn back to, like, you know, protecting the family unit, you know, and, and all that, then, like, it's going to take a, a, a pretty brutal war, a gender war, in order to, because women are so empowered with this hubris they have now. You know, I mean, that you look at it. And this is what I call evolutionary showdown. You know, I mentioned the evolutionary part of it, you know, where, well, you know, biology is inherently gynocentric, you know, because the female has to be accommodated in order to reproduce a species and all that. But through all this constant accommodation of the female's needs and desires, um, it, it generates and cultivates a hubris, a, a very selfish mentality. Um, and meanwhile... The male who's doing this for the good of the species is also cultivating a very self, a very selfless uh, nature within himself, and this is why you know when a man loses a job, he blows his head off, and you know whenever a female loses her job, she just you know shacks up with another guy, has some sex with him, and all that, and he provides for her. You know, what I mean, <clears throat> um. And of course, like Stardust mentioned, and, and Stardust is correct, that women have overinflated the value of their vagina and their uterus and all that. And this gets into Harlow's monkeys. You need to study Harlow's monkeys. That's like, oh, like hardcore, just raw, like, evidence of like, because cause this isn't monkeys, you know, Reese's monkeys. You know, this isn't some kind of like social construct of gender created by like men of the patriarchy. No, this is like biology here, you know? Like a baby monkey taken from birth from his mother, like immediately after it's born, taken from his mother, put on basically a feeding machine, and then raised on two different surrogate mothers, you know. One may, you know, one consisting of, you know, metal wire and, and wood and all that. And it has, you know, a, a, basically a, a baby bottle in there to feed it, you know, to provide nourishment. And then the other one has no nourishment at all, and, and it looks more desirable to the monkey, you know. And it's got cloth on it, and it's got a heating device in there. And so, you know, it's, it's to see which, which attribute of a mother character is more important to the baby monkey. Is it going to be the basic, you know, nourishment and sustenance? Uh, you know, which is going to take priority, you know, the um, the basic nourishment to, to survive or, you know, the, the you know, or, or the, satisf the satisfaction of a psychological urge for contact comfort, you know, and clinging to the, the cloth mother and, you know, and that sort of thing and, and clutching, you know, uh, and, and gripping on to the, the mother. And what Harry Harlow actually discovered is that for at least 18 hours of the day, the uh, <clears throat> at least 18 hours of the day, the, the, the baby monkey, the newborn monkey, would just hang on, you know, to the mother made of cloth that was warm and soft, and then only when he was feeling like he was starving to death, then he would just, like, timidly go over to the wire mother, you know, the, made out of just wire mesh, and cl and then grip onto it, suck on the bottle for a couple minutes, and then go back over to you know the cloth mother that was warm and soft, you know. And this is in baby monkeys, you know what I mean? In primates and all that, and humans have the same fundamental you know uh, needs as like that monkey for contact, comfort, and of course, obviously for nourishment. I mean, even a caterpillar needs you know nourishment and all that, you know. And, 
But it just shows the psycho, you know, the fundamental building blocks of the psychological composition of primates. And this is why, you know, whenever a woman screams for help, everybody like snaps to attention and and pursues the safety, you know, and, and, and make sure they prioritize the safety of that female in comparison to the safety of a male, you know, because the perception is, well, he's big and strong and tough, he can take care of himself, Mah. or or how about this one, you ever seen that video uh, from like ABC News, like investigative, whatever it is, investigative reporting where, <clears throat> you know, the reaction to men being abused in public, you can find it on YouTube, it's been in circulation for like, I don't know, a year that I know of, anyway, and it's like they have these people functioning as actors, and you know they got this guy saying all this bad stuff to a woman. And everybody gets all pissed off, it's like hey, asshole, y'all know better. Don't you know how to treat a lady? I don't know, call the police now, you asshole, you Debbie dumbass. Mah. You know, and then <clears throat> and then like and then they switch it around. Then they have uh, <laughs> then they have this woman just totally hammering on this guy, like. And he's sitting there on a park bench trying to read a newspaper. And he's just sitting there trying to read the paper. And this woman's like, you're like, can't you hear me? Stop ignoring me. Man, she like slaps him in the face and pulls his hair and actually almost has her mouth touch his ear and screams in the freaking side of his head. You know, and it's like, you know, kicking him. It's like, and she's like all mad. What was it? 160 people walk by doing nothing. You know, they notice it. How can you not notice, you know, all this screaming and shouting and all these sudden movements and all that? The guy's trying to read the newspaper. He's just sitting there trying to read the newspaper, totally silent, you know? And occasionally you might hear the, the crinkling of paper as he turns a page. And, like, the woman's just, like, totally abusing him, you know, and all this other kind of stuff. And then you know, more than 100 people, they just walk by, you know, minding their own business <laughs> and all that. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> don't think anything about it. And then... And then uh, there's this one woman by the name of Linda McCoofy, I think it is, and because they interviewed her later, <laughs> and as uh, and as she and as she walks by, you know, it's because you know on a park bench next to a sidewalk, you know, and everybody's walking by, you know, in the park, you know, because they don't want to step on the grass and like ruin nature, and it's just more convenient to walk on the sidewalk than it is out in the grass because you never know whose dog might have, you know, dumped a pile in there. So like at least on the sidewalk, you know if or not there's going to be poop. So, <clears throat> anyway, um, so Linda McCoofy walks by, you know, and uh, she sees what's going on. She sees that woman, like, sticking it to the man. Man. And, and you can see her. She's, like, all acts like she's punching one of them little punching bag things like Rocky used to punch. The one where you're supposed to hit it so rapidly it sounds like a machine gun. Man. You know, and like one of the little teardrop shape, uh, you know, punching bags that they have hanging from. Anyway, she's just like, you're like, you go, girl. You know, she gets all excited about it and all that and then walks off. And then <clears throat> later, you know, the ABC News crew or whatever, they, they stopped her and they interviewed her. And then, <laughs> and then, oh my gosh, Linda says, you know, I thought really good for her. I mean, she must have caught him doing something really bad, like like cheating. Okay, remember that. Remember that. So a woman, spontaneous woman, or a random woman, walked by and seen, you know, the, the you know the the woman beating on the man, and then thought that the man must have done something to deserve violence. You know, and then the reason why supposedly he deserved violence was because he was having you know. Uh, uh, relations with another woman who wasn't his spouse or girlfriend. Okay? Now remember that. This particular woman, Linda McCoofy, uh, interpreted the situation as that way. <clears throat> okay. Then later, the ABC uh, news guy or whatever, um, he, um, he, he, he interviews a group of people. I don't know, a dozen, maybe a dozen and a half, maybe even two dozen people. They're in a room and lets them watch the video that unfolded. And, you know, I believe there were several women in the room, or maybe it was all women, I'll have to watch it again, but there were women in there, <clears throat> and the ABC News guy, I forget his name, and, you know, he asked uh, the women, you know, what they thought about, you know, the, the scenario, and it was very good reporting, I enjoyed it. And, um, and then, uh, 
So they, uh, so that guy, you know, the news guy or the ABC news guy, you know, the news, the ABC network employee, he he interviewed these women, and they were various different ages. Some of them looked like they were they were in their early twenties. Some of them looked like they're in their mid thirties, and just ages in between, you know. <clears throat> and uh, he asked them what they were thinking, you know, and you know how they interpreted the situation. Well, they seen the violence. How could you not? They were watching the TV, you know. They were watching the video recording on the TV in the room. And the guy and the news guy asked them how they, you know, how they uh, interpreted the situation. And these women, they said, well, well, I thought that, you know, he, you know, that, that the woman had caught him cheating on her. And almost, almost the universal answer was, I thought the guy was cheating on the woman and that, you know, and that he, you know, he, he had earned this, that he, that, you know, that he deserved it because, you know, he, that he had done something really, really bad like cheating. Wow. So according to women, cheating is really bad, right? Okay, well, if it's so bad, then why do women do it to men so much of, of the time, you know? Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, it's like, is cheating bad or is it not bad? You know, well, I'm willing to believe that it's something bad. But if it's something bad, then why do women do it so much and flaunt it so much? I mean, I'm not saying that men don't do it either, but like when men do it, obviously they get beat up. You know, as an ABC News report shows, you know, and it's like, not all men get beat up all the time. Well, I remember when I used to work security over, you know, and it was in the year 2005, and what was this time, 2006? Anyway, the point is, you know, it's like, well, you know, the, the, um, <clears throat> there was the, this one festivities or some kind of event in the city nearby, and it caused for, oh, it was a ball game, that's what it was. And then, so there's extra people around, the police had to like, you know, like, direct traffic and just because you know, there's extra people around and that sort of thing and you know so there's all these cop cars around because they're managing the situation and making sure that you know all this mass amount of vehicles can get through this area without a wreck and <clears throat> so here's this woman and this guy they were in their 20s or whatever uh at the time um, i guess they were around my age maybe at the time anyway you know, they, and the girl was all upset. She's like all crying. They're like, oh, how could you do this to me? Rah, rah, rah. And like, the guy was just like, looked like he was like the lamb going to the slaughter. Rah, you know? And then, and then the woman's like, oh, how could you do this to me? You cheating on me. You cheating on me. Rah. And she freaking slapped him right there in front of me. You know, I mean, she didn't slap me. She slapped her boyfriend or whoever he was, you know? And then, just freaking slapped him upside the face and was treating him all mean like that, you know? And, uh, of course, I was ignorant of this kind of thing, so I go in white night down there, you know, I see a, a woman in distress, you know, here's my instinct. It's like, you got to defend the woman. I'm like, hey, what's going on down here? Then, you know, I, you know, I was like, you know, I'm being all a little bit pushy to the guy, and I'm, I'm actually ashamed of that because as far as I know, I mean, I had no evidence that he had done anything wrong. All I seen was a girl yelling at him and slapping him in the face while he just stood there and was being completely submissive. And, I mean, he wasn't, like, kissing up to her, but he just, he just stood there and took it like, Oh, man. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, that sort of thing. I've seen so many of these situations like that. Uh, women feel entitled to use violence if it satisfies their selfish emotional drive. Just... I mean, you look at it. I mean, I've seen so many situations of this kind of thing. <clears throat> I remember when I also worked security over in that city. You know, I was working at a hotel on this one job site. And, you know, for, I, don't know I don't even know why this girl was fighting with this guy. But you know, I was called up there to deal with some kind of disturbance or whatever in one of the hotel rooms. And, like, the whole time we went up in there to, like, keep the peace... The guy was just pretty much nice. I mean, nice as in like, you know, being cooperative and not causing any trouble and this and that. <clears throat> and me and this guy, this security officer that looked like Barack Obama, but he wasn't Obama. He just kind of resembled him, you know, a little bit. And the inside joke was that we called this guy Obama, you know, because he kind of looked like him, you know. But there was an age difference and a height difference and a voice sound difference. I mean, it wasn't Obama, but anyway, the point is... Uh, <clears throat> you know, we had to go deal with this situation. And when we went up in there to go keep the peace and, like, calm everybody down, the guy was just 
pretty much cooperative, pretty passive and all that. I mean, he just, well, I say pretty passive because, like, he was just basically dodging punches and dodging, you know, flying objects and stuff like that. And this woman is, like, basically trying to provoke him. And she's using this opportunity, you know, of these two male security officers standing there witnessing what's going on. And what she's trying to do is she's she's like she's like freaking hitting him, not like really bad, not like he's like serious injury or anything like that, but just just hitting you know hitting him a bit, throwing stuff at him, you know, throwing piles of clothes at him, you know, throwing suitcases and objects at him, and all that, and trying to well trying to frustrate and provoke him, and she and you can just see she just kept on instigating more and more stuff trying to provoke a reaction from him, trying to get him to hit her while we're witnessing, so then we'll beat up the guy to defend the woman. Man! And uh, I, I, I had seen enough of that situation. I've seen that the guy, and this was a couple years after that one incident with, uh, you know, where, where the, all those police were around and I was white knighting, you know, because I heard the distressed female and she slapped the guy. Well, this is a couple years after that, so I wised up a little bit. And, um... That was before I even knew that a men's movement existed and before I even woke up about this kind of stuff. It's what people call the blue pill days. Anyway, so uh, so this guy, he's just standing there taking all this abuse. The girl just keeps throwing stuff and instigating and calling him bad names and just cussing at him and all kind of stuff. You know, having all this fight in her, you know. And then, you know, and, and she's like, get rid of this guy, man, man. She wants us to do her bidding. She keeps saying all kinds of stuff like, he's rational, man, and all that. And, like, she's like, he, oh, he did this to me. Oh, he, he, he threatened this. And, like, the guy didn't look like he had done anything like that, you know. I mean, like, his behavior was not consistent with her allegations and all that, and I, I've said something to the effect of like, you know what, y'all can kill each other for my, you know, you know, it's like y'all can kill each other for all I care. Just don't do it where I work, you know. And it's like, why don't you go out in the parking lot and fight, you know? And because like I was still under the impression that yes, men use the patriarchy to abuse women, and my, you know, I was under that you know belief system, you know, because that's how we're all raised. You know, it's like the men are the ones who betray the human family. Man, when in reality, it's actually the woman is like freaking Darth Sidious from Star Wars, and she's been doing it to the whole family the whole damn time, and she just pins it all on the men. You know, it's like the men become like the Jedi, and, and it's like the woman is, you know, the women, the, the female human is like Darth Sidious, and you know, or well, basically Palpatine. And she's like. The Jedi, they're trying to, they're trying to, uh, like, instill dictatorship, and, and they're trying to instill tyranny in the Republic, and uh, it's the Jedi's fault, and, <laughs> and believe me, and it can, uh, it's the Jedi that are causing all the problems, and, uh, and so, like, you know how that whole situation unfolded and all that, so that's just basically an exaggerated Anyway, of anyway, um, so uh, so we finally broke up this fight. Actually, this one-sided fight in which this guy was just trying to dodge flying objects and all that, and he was subject to all these unsubstantiated claims and allegations and all this other stuff. So, like, you know, the guy's got to leave the scene and all that to keep the conflict from stirring up. So, you know, we escorted the guy out and blah, blah, took him down to the lobby and he was just checking out of the hotel and all that. He was crying. He was in tears. Standing right there in the lobby at the desk in tears. And, you know, he walked out, you know, with his tail between his legs like men are expected to. And I felt sympathy for him. You know, that, that, that female that he wasted his time with, you know, and just mistreated him and all that. And I see so many situations like that. You know, and it's like, why do people feel that they're entitled to violence, you know? I mean, it's like, you know, I, was, I mean, I was taught that violence was wrong. You know, so I'm under the belief that violence is wrong. But according to women, violence is all good, if it's the woman doing it. You know, and not all women, you know, are, are behaving like that. However, all women do have the potential to be like that, just like all humans have the potential to be like that. 
You know, I mean, it's because it's a human thing. You know, women are not distance. The women, women are not distance. They're not distance from the reach of negative human emotion. You know, I know that women want to portray themselves as sugar and spice and everything nice because they want to be trusted and all that. And seriously, you ought to go read Esther Viller's book titled, you know, The Manipulated Man. I finished reading it like, I don't know, a few weeks ago or whatever. It's pretty good. Now, I think it needs a rewrite. Um, one of these days, maybe I'll be the person who, like, rewrites segments of it and all that. Just for e efficiency and articulation, um, you know, purposes. I mean... The gist of what she's talking about is accurate. I mean, it's just observations of stuff, you know? But the, the, the book was written more than 40 years ago, so it's a bit outdated, you know? So I think it needs to be rewritten and articulated better. It's just like a computer programmer, you know? They, they, um, they design a program. And, you know, and then, well, you know, uh, I don't know, a few months later or whatever, a few weeks later, they, look, they go back and they look at their program code and they find ways in which they can make the, the program run more efficiently and to, to better suit what they were trying to get it to do. Uh, to use less computer memory. To use less computer clock cycles in order to execute an operation. And to make it overall more efficient. Uh, this happens all the time in computer programming. I mean, it's, it's the norm. It's called optimization. Um... But anyway, <clears throat> um, I just wanted to articulate some of this stuff. And I know there's a lot of stuff that I did not cover. I can just talk and articulate this for hours, jumping in between different levels of detail. You know, but Mr. Repzion, I just wanted to, you know, I just wanted to really make a video response in which... Oh, we're looking at two and a half hours here. Oh my gosh, this is what I'm known for. But I got a lot. I got a lot. My brain contains a lot of information. You know what I mean? There are volumes of information in which my brain processes at any given time. You know, it's just you got to understand what it's like for me. You know what I mean? It's like, I know people get fed up with my long videos or the length of whatever, but I just spend so much... This level of detail for taking in and processing information is just so... It comes natural to me. I take in a lot. And matter of fact, you know... Like, when I go to articulate it, it seems like it's lengthy, but that's actually, like, a condensed version of what I take in. You know, it's like, yeah. I mean, well, it's like, think about it this way. You eat a big meal. You know, you eat a big pizza, you eat this, you eat that, right? You eat a big meal. Well, it gets digested in your stomach, and your body extracts what it needs from it, and then it poops out a, a much, you know, a, a significantly smaller volume of of matter, you know, that is disproportionate to the amount that you have intaken. You know what I mean? That you have taken in. I don't know. I guess it's like that. You know, and I guess you can make fun of me or whatever you want. So it's like all he does is just he spews out poop. You know, I, I guess I wouldn't be offended by that because it's just like you're taking an excerpt from, like, what I said and just, I don't know, making an expression. You know what? It doesn't even matter, you know? Because, like, with all the crap that I've been through, that I've been subjected to by, like, people in society and, and especially women and just, you know, people's ignorance and people's just... With all the crap that I've been through... You know, you can just make a video flipping me the middle finger, and I don't think that I'm going to be all that bothered by it, you know? Um, <clears throat> and, I mean, I'm not saying that that's what you're going to do. You know, maybe you won't even feel like flipping me a middle finger. I'm just using that as a hypothetical situation. You know what I mean? It's just like, you know, and like, you know, the uh, my colleague, the Disposable Human Doing, you know, who's in some of my videos, you know, he... Um, and, uh, and some of my lectures and all that, he's, you know, he makes a guest appearance every once in a while because he just lives like a mile and a half away or something like that. 
Uh, no, no, he lives about 2.1 miles away. And the point is, anyway, um, he, uh, you know, uh, he he was uh, he he was a subject of a mis you know a sexual misconduct allegation. You know he was uh, he was over here like last night talking about it uh, to you know somebody else on the phone because we were both talking to this one dude uh, who lives in Florida, <clears throat> and um, I don't live in Florida, but anyway. Um, so then you know me and the disposable human doing we were here last night, and he was updating his, his software on um you know on his computer and he um he, well he likes to use like every time he comes over now he likes to use my internet to do like online gaming and stuff because he don't have internet where he lives yet anyway and um and i mean i like video gaming a whole lot but it just i haven't been playing video games lately i mean like most of this year i haven't played video games for like most of this year 2013 I, mean, I like video games and all that. Just, I've been busy with other stuff. Instead of playing, I felt like doing work. Because well, there's all these projects I work on, and apparently I'm like the only person that can do them or knows how to do them or has the capability or like has the... whatever the case may be. But anyway, um, you know, watching movies, yeah, I've been doing that kind of stuff because it's study material for me. Um, but, you know, the disposable human doing, you know, DHD, the disposable human doing, he came over here and he was talking about his sexual misconduct allegation. And what was going on <clears throat> is basically he was at a party with some friends and he, he only really wants to hang around with his male friends because they're the only ones that have, like, common interest with him. And, but, yeah, these, these males, you know, they won't go without validation. They won't go without a woman. they got to have their woman with them all the time. Of course, the woman, you know, has to, well, i got to be with them all the time, supervise them, make sure you don't talk about, you know, don't, got to make sure you don't spread rumors behind my back and make sure he's not cheating or anything. I know my former owner did the same thing to me also, you know, my, my first and only girlfriend. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I'm not pathetic because I've only had one girlfriend before. Gosh, look how many I've turned... Look how many women I've turned down in the past year and a half, you know? It's like, well, all the female friend requests on Facebook, you know? Like, females send me friend requests, like, like every week, every month, whatever, on Facebook. And I just keep ignoring them. <clears throat> you know? Um... And, you know, like, you know, if Girl Writes What or Aaron Pitsy, you know, sent me a friend request, then, yeah, I would I would accept that because these women actually have some kind of valuable input to, like, put into the equation. And, you know, common interest, we, we you know, we study effectively human nature and this and that. Um, and besides, you know, a girl writes what? She's in her 40s. Aaron Pitsy is, like, in her 70s, I think. So, you know, these people behave a lot more mature than even women my own age, which I'm 33. <clears throat> um, anyway, um, so, um, yeah, so these guys, you know, at that party, they couldn't be without their girls and all that, not even for a day or whatever. And so my friend, you know, he was like kind of bored, you know, so he decided, to, you know, well, that was later. But anyway, you know, they were at the party and they're all socializing and stuff. And, you know, this girl decides, you know, it's like, I want to dance, man. Like, so, you know, my friend's there and, and um, you know, it's probably an awkward situation, I can imagine. You know, and she's like, well, here, the guy just stands there and kind of does this. And, you know, just kind of throws his hands up and, man, man, and then... You know, the girl's supposed to grind on him. Man, that's how you dance, man. So anyway, she's grinding on him, you know, rubbing her butt on, on his groin, like, so much. It, it practically amounts to dry humping. Yeah, she just decides up and do that, you know, because she wants attention from men and all that. And he's, like, the only one there without a girlfriend or something. So I guess that's why she chose him for for that venue. And then, um, so, uh... <clears throat> So, um, you know, then later on he gets bored and decides to watch a movie sitting on the couch because everybody just went on to do their own thing. And then, uh, you know, this girl lays out across, you know, his lap and all that. And it's just all kind of like, you know, cuddling, sort of, and, you know, and, and uh, levity and whatever. So, you know, he's trying to watch the movie and he, uh, he decides to, uh, 
to grab her butt and all that. Well, you know, then uh, then uh, <laughs> shortly after, the guy who she really wanted to get with comes in the room and all that. So, you know, this girl don't want to be caught, you know, uh, cheating or being a tramp or, or, you know, having fidelity problems or whatever. So what does she do? Yeah, she decides to, like, invent some kind of story uh, based, of course, around the the ever so overdone but, like, apparently never burn out uh, victim narrative uh, because of her gender. And uh, this, of course, where, you know, a woman portrays herself as a victim even when she's not um, because it affords her something that she desires. Uh, so anyway, <clears throat> you know, and she says, when, when, the, when the guy she really wants to get with comes in the room, she says, oh, I, I guess I must have fallen asleep, you know, and then basically implying that, you know, my friend, the disposable human doing, took advantage of her while she was sleeping. She basically invented a, a narrative, like, right then and there, you know, and then, um, and then she hops up off the couch and goes about her way and does whatever, and later, you know, um, his friends, you know, like one of his friends tells him, like, everybody's mad at you, man. He's like, you know, and this is like the next day. And the disposable human doing, you know, my friend, he says, um, he says, what do you mean everybody's mad at you? Oh, everybody's mad. And the response he got back was, everybody's mad at you. How could you molest her like that? Man. How could you sexually assault her? Man. She was just, man. Whatever, and you know, like everybody believed it, or at least acted like they did. Well, guess what? About a week or two later, uh, to add insult to injury, this girl shows up at the disposable human doings house. She shows up uninvited, unannounced, to drop off a stray cat. Okay, now, if this girl had been sexually assaulted, like she alleges then why is she showing up at the, the guy's house uninvited and unannounced <clears throat> to do something such as just dropping off a stray cat? It's like, oh, we just thought you might like this cat. Nah. You know, and, and didn't, act, didn't act like anything was wrong or whatever, you know? And um, Anyway, then a few weeks after that, she shows up again, uninvited, unannounced, like like it's no big deal, because like she just so happened to be in the vehicle with her, fem you know, with her female friend, and they just wanted to like I don't know, hang out or like whatever. So it just really aggravates my friend, you know, the disposable human doing, because here he is, you know, that you know, like within an hour after he finds out, that, you know, that supposedly he sexually assaulted this girl. He's like he's all like almost in a state of panic and shock and all that. <clears throat> and he's he's like he, he's he's contemplating and thinking about gagging himself on the barrel of his Mosin Nagant before pulling the trigger because he feels like he betrayed, you know, you know, the most vulnerable member of society. He feels that He's betrayed all innocence and like he's done something horrible because we all we always hear about how horrible rape is. Okay, well if rape is so horrible, why is it so damn laughable when it happens to men in prison? You know why? Like yeah, like like Barbarossa. He put up that video clip from a TV show. It's like some character or some guy by the name of David Acevedo or whatever. You know he was sexually assaulted somewhere like. You know, for whatever reason, I don't know, like, as he was, like, pursuing a lead for, like, this criminal investigation, or whatever the case may be. It's some kind of show on TV, and the girl tells him to just suck it up and get, and to get over it, to just deal with his, you know, with being sexually assaulted. And I don't know, like, like, whenever, you know, something happens to a man, um, you know, but at the same, when, when something happens to, see, there's a differential in treatment. And that creates a, a unique psychology amongst the people involved. And, you know, so like, I mean, seriously, I mean, look at that injustice. You know, I mean, you know, when, when a guy is sexually assaulted or raped or whatever, you know, he's like made to feel like it's not some big deal. And it's like, well, just get over it. You know, so you got your bicycle stolen. Wow, you know, stop crying over spilled milk. The world goes on. 
You know, and then when, you know, an equivalent, or how about, you know, a situation that never even happened to a woman, to a particular woman, and she just wants to, you know, cry foul or whatever for attention or a payoff or a settlement or for sympathy or for trust gaining or whatever, like that news reporter did a while back, um, where she alleged that some Hispanic guy raped her in a park or something like that in New York City or wherever it was. And then, <clears throat> totally invented an allegation. And then women do it, you know, to explain why they missed out on work. Well, gosh, look at the famous Hofstra University case. Where that, where that woman or that girl, you know, she's like, well, she's like, basically cheats on her boyfriend. It's so like, well, he's just not satisfying enough, man. So, like, she goes to a party and has sex with a couple guys and all that. And, and gets back from that, and then she, like, I don't know, the way I read the story in the newspaper or whatever, it's like, you know, in the article, it's like, you know, the guy just kind of ran into her, you know, like, I don't know, like, in a hallway of a building or something like that, or wherever it was, and uh, and, he, and he said that, you know, he described that, you know, his girlfriend looked like she had just got done having hot, passionate sex, and, um... And then he asked her, it's like, hey, what's going on? Where you been? And she's just like, oh, yeah, yeah I got raped. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And just walks, you know, just walks out, you know, just like, yeah, just like, oh, 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 oh. It's, like, it's like, like, oh, yeah, I was raped. You know, well, like that. that. That's how the article described it. And these guys, they were accused, you know, they went to jail and just, they're, just all this horrible ordeal. And then, you know, the girl recanted her story, you know, she's like, later on, she's like, no, I just made up the allegation because I didn't want my boyfriend to find out that that I was cheating on him. And the guys were released from prison and then or jail or whatever the case may be. Well, anyway, well they were looking at like however many years or decades in prison for this supposedly horrible crime that apparently ain't all that horrible when it happens to men. See, that's the thing: is rape bad or is it not bad? I mean, well, I'm willing to believe that rape is bad. But, you know, you see these, these contradicting examples, you know, all involving the same thing. So it's like, is it or is it not? You know, and um, it just shows the female psychology and that sort of thing. There's a significant biological betrayal of the human species that the female has brought upon uh, the human family. Uh, basically, I'm going to summarize it this way. When all is said and done, in the end... Society will realize, will realize that it was the female of the human species that betrayed the entire human, you know, it was the female, human, you know, it was the human female that, that betrayed the entire human species or the entire human family because she, she could not get her selfishness under control. That's what we'll learn from the experiment of feminism and all that kind of thing. And see even the supposedly nice feminists that supposedly believe in gender equality or whatever. You know, it's like, look, they, they still believe in the... All feminism, all feminist organizations and entities all universally believe in the patriarchy theory. Now, what does that tell you? The patriarchy theory is actually a conspiracy theory. A stupid, cockamamie, bizarre... I mean, it might as well be akin to, like, freaking aliens invading. You know what I mean? <clears throat> And yet they fabricate this stuff. Women were never oppressed by men. You know, there was never some government tyranny oppressing them like what was done to the Jews by Nazi Germany. You know, it was never like that for women. You know, now I agree that women are oppressed, but not the way in which they say that they are oppressed. Uh, women oppress themselves. They are victims of themselves. They are the ones who chose the path of least significance throughout human developmental evolution. Um, you know, <clears throat> basically what, what oppresses women is their biology. Look at it. You know, a woman can't pursue a career field if she wants to have kids. She can't, <clears throat> she can't have kids if she wants to pursue a, you know, it just, you know, to juggle between two different things like that. A woman, and see, that's the thing, it's a testament to the, to the psychology of a woman. 
look at it, you know, when it comes to business and academia and government and all this kind of, and, and well, you see video game consumerism with Anita Sarkeesian. You know, they invade male spaces and all that, and they want to be up on par with men, but yeah, they don't want to earn it. They only see, you know, they, they want everything to accommodate them. And it's like, look at all these false rape allegations going around. You know, somebody I work with, her son was falsely accused of rape or like whatever. And the disposable human doing was accused of sexual assault. And gosh, like the, the, the accusation that I was subjected to was so freaking laughable. I mean, if it wasn't such, you know, a testament of a sick mind, <clears throat> you know, where like... I don't, I don't know if my former owner accused me of this or was it just somebody in her household who was mad and vindictive because I had kicked out my former owner and then therefore they had to go back and live with their family and then their family was all frustrated at the situation or whatever and they're just blowing off steam by accusing me of raping her. But anyway, <clears throat> I don't know if this accusation was dated from the time after I kicked her out or before because I heard of it, you know, through the grapevine or whatever. What it was is, um, you know, okay, here's how the rape, okay, the disposable human doing, he was talking to his dad, you know, this was like a year and a half ago or almost, well, a little over a year ago, you know, trying, you know, he was moving out of his dad's place and, I don't know, getting it, you know, getting his belongings and all that, and his dad says, oh, "Don't hang around with that man slave guy." It's like I hear that he raped his girlfriend. Man, man, man. It's like, and and I heard that you were there too. And it's like both of you guys were in the back bedroom, and like he was raping her, and you were just sitting there laughing and agging it on. Man, that's the rape allegation, you know. So it was told to the disposable human doing by his dad. But then it was told to the disposable human doings dad by some guy who shacked up with the mother of my former owner. So it's like, it's just hearsay stuff. But yeah, you know, and I was just like, I wasn't even, a, you know, I wasn't even like really moved by the allegation or whatever. Maybe I just, I knew it was so false and it's like, didn't, you know, and then like it didn't really hit home in terms of like everybody you know, marching with pitchforks and, and torches and all that. And, I mean, it's just like, first of all, you'd have to prove... See, it all hinges upon, you know, uh, other attributes of, you know, the story. You know, it's like, you know, it's like, was this after I kicked her out or before I kicked her out? You know, and was it on a night when the disposable human doing was there? You know, it's like, you know, um, and that sort of thing. And uh, and see, women are, are, are in the process right now of flooding the system with false rape allegations. And they do it because they, they, right now they only see the benefits. You know, they see that they can get court settlements. You know, they can get full custody, you know, full unconditional custody of their children. So they can get all the freaking welfare and food stamps and WIC benefits and all kind of stuff. You know, they can milk you know milk the system for sympathy you know they can have the power of like you know getting back at their ex for whatever reason and and just basically satisfying all these negative selfish impulses and they only see the benefits right now they 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 are you know women are like a kid in the candy store you know uh, right now regarding rape allegations and honestly, I know how this is going to be interpreted, but I'm all in favor for it. Because after the system gets so clogged and congested and bogged down with all these rape allegations, maybe then women will see that it was their own gender that betrayed them. You know, it's just like all the, it's just like immigration reform and all that. You know, like all these, you know, uh, people who immigrated to the United States legally and who wanted to be an American citizen and who were, you know, proud to go through the, through the responsibilities of citizenship and, and go through all the processing and all that, you know, because they decided that they want this country to be their home or whatever. You know, they feel like they're punched in the face by the people that just run across the border just, you know what I mean, you know, and just illegal immigration. I mean, it's that type of a scenario. And in which immigrants do, you know, they, 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 um, 
betray other immigrants or even immigrants of their own nationality or whatever the case may be. And it's just basically a selfish person trampling over, you know, a selfless person. It's that same dynamic over and over again. And we're all going to learn a big lesson from the, the situation uh, that's, unfold, that's unfolding. And the gloves are going to come off on both sides. And it's, it's going to heat up and be pretty brutal. I'm not saying that anybody's going to get killed or violence or, or, like, or overthrow of government. I, I don't think it's... I don't think it's really going to be that way. I think it's going to be more of like within people's minds. You know, they're just going to be fed up and just stop trusting. You know, and then it just it'll just revert back to a system of it's like you know what you say you were sexual assault. You're just going to have to deal with it yourself, man. You know the whole you know uh, what they call like was it emotional fatigue or something like that will probably set in. And it just, as with any system, you know, it's like, it's like when a person goes to the grocery store and then they try to do double and triple and even quadruple couponing on an item, you know, the, 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 uh, the store, you know, just ends up saying, it's like, you know, you can only use a coupon once or a coupon, you can only use it once, okay, you know, and that sort of thing, you know, it's like, well, we have to stop accepting coupons for this product because we're losing money, man, or whatever the case may be. You know, maybe that wasn't even a very accurate description. But, I mean, it still shows, you know. When in, when anything's abused to, to a certain extent, it's generally taken away. It's just like with, with network transactions and, like, the Internet and all that. You know, all service providers have to provide some kind of a cap, uh, a restriction on usage. Like, even if they say they give you unlimited, that doesn't mean absolute unlimited, um... Because let's say you get unlimited on a service plan, whether it's cable internet, DSL, Wi-Fi, satellite, whatever. Well, the thing is, there's a certain cost that incurs for the service. Because uh, it takes electricity to run the computer systems, to run the broadcast systems, to just, you know, the, the infrastructure takes maintenance and all that. And it needs money for that. So they can't, you know, just... You know, they can't, you know, the money you pay in doesn't always cover all of the usage that you might want to do. And how about think of it this way? Let's say they do, you know, give you unlimited consumption, you know, like unlimited amounts of gigabytes of transfer per month. Or even well, if it gets into terabytes and petabytes, you know. Well, well the thing is, if they don't put some kind of restriction system uh, into place then what happens if your computer is hijacked as part of what they call one of them zombie attacks and denial of service attacks on the internet and for websites and all that and on you know various server systems well if there's not some kind of you know consumption cap restriction in place then 